Ready? Yeah, we're Here's ready. what I do on this podcast. My goal on this podcast is to take people that someone, everyone's already a fan of you. You made it. You're famous. Not now. everybody. Somebody sent me a death threat and wanted to break my legs. That's because they probably knew you and were jealous. And they were like, he can regenerate. He's yeah, He'll know what to do. They didn't like that I liked women. I said, women are the strongest sex. And right? he said, what are you going on about? Okay. And so he was what is angry. this on Instagram? This he emailed me mm -hmm. and he said, uh, I assume it's a he. He said, What was uh, the what was the email provider? I can already tell you what you're dealing with. Was it an AOL? Was it an, an <laughs> Earthlink? I know, can tell I you which ones to remember. delete without we, even opening them. We can them. ask Boston police. Where yeah, it no came one from. is threatening you from a Gmail. I feel like this is from an, an Earthlink.net, a hotmail. Yeah, probably a DM somewhere. Uh-huh. Yeah, it was vicious. Uh, and do you do you look at all of your emails? I do. Huh. I do. I used to reply to all of them. How does that not aid you? Isn't that <laughs> the first? It's really hard. <laughs> right. As right. like sort of the foremost authority on anti-aging. <laughs> Don't you feel like that undoes all of the supplements you take? Yeah. Well, it's pretty stressful what I do, but uh, then I have to counter it with all this other science. So I have to science my way out of it. Sure. And then just in terms of becoming a famous scientist, I because here's what I'll say for anyone that knows me, anyone watching this podcast, this is the most gussied up I've ever gotten for a podcast. I'm I, it's very hard for me to get starstruck. I get starstruck by like super brains that I admire like yours. I have read your book numerous times. Uh, I remember when your R Rogan podcast came out. That was like a two years ago it was over like the holidays and i listened to it over and over again because i don't have a family and nowhere to go on the holidays so i spent it with you learning how to stay young i've made so many life decisions based like you're such a big part of my life and you know you don't even know it yeah i want to hear all about yeah that. we are you're a big part of my i'm stalking you I, yeah i'm like very did, did you send me an email i sent you an email i just i wasn't i was exaggerating i was trying to be funny when i said <laughs> yeah. i was gonna break your legs it was more like i just want you to come in my house and then i need to handicap oh. you so you can't leave it was it right. was a joke i have to tell the police it's to called satire don't worry about it yeah um but so i am fully wearing jockey pants i put on like flats with bows on them to try to impress you i don't know what my goal even was i'm here. very impressed i don't know what i'm doing and to talk to talk about anti-aging on a podcast i dressed like a 75 year old <laughs> lady I, I look older for this podcast for some reason i put on like mad men red lipstick like i don't my my goal is say hey i used all of your advice and look how young i look and i dressed old for some reason just to be like hey you think your science works why do i look like this a total just self-sabotage move on my part but you're looking great don't thank worry you about oh well, okay finally I, you the, said the it new, finally the now new I can move on oh, i was waiting for that isn't that what you wanted me to say so you're a world famous biologist now. You are a professor of what, it, am I gonna say this right? Try. Professor of genetics? Yep. Is that correct? Uh, yep, so you far. Have numerous labs around the world, one of which is at a little place called Harvard. Yeah. It, you can't get more esteemed and accomplished than you. Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, I do. Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, now I'm, I'm all nervous on attention because you said I'm the most amazing guy, and now whatever I say, it's all downhill from here. Well, look, I'm because I'm gonna throw some things at you that you may not have discussed on podcast before because I don't want to repeat stuff that's already been on Joe Rogan. You guys have followed David Sinclair. I'd say listen to his Rogan again before pause this go and then come back because i want to build on some of that and i want to get into your book lifespan because i have questions i have i have had this interview in my imagination for two years now well let's do it no pressure i'm going to start with a couple questions i also want to you're from you're australian i am i'm obsessed with uh ancestral trauma and how we inherit it how it imprints on our genes if it what we inherit is there anything specific about australian ancestral trauma am i allowed to bring up that it, convicts used to go there is there anything they, yeah there's a, there's a lot of that guilt that we're all convicts we're all bad people and because we didn't come from puritans it's the opposite if you're a, if you're an australian kid especially males and you try to do well at school you get beaten up we call it the tall puppy syndrome if you stick your head up you get cut off so i had to escape that because I'm way an overachiever. So. so it's shame about doing too well or doing better than anybody else as to make them feel bad? 
right with so your that, there's a whole bunch of us uh, we weren't nerds but we were like we did okay in exams we wouldn't talk about it we would never say what grades we actually got i would use a different vocabulary i, I would have to filter big words so that i didn't sound wow. smart so then i came here and people went uh hey it's okay to use your vocabulary it's okay to do okay in life right i'll stay here this we sounds pretty good. We, yeah we celebrate and glamorize being better than everybody else yeah plus i'm a, a I try really hard, mm -hmm. so I'm, it looks like I'm not trying, but I'm swimming really hard under the water. Is there anything to be said about, you know, inheriting whatever criminal, whatever that even means, <laughs> thinking? Criminals are very creative. They don't love authority. They go, oh, you said this is true? I'm going to do my own, do this on my own. Yeah. I'm going to do something that might be a little bit... Um, ethically on the fence so that I can get this bigger result, you know, just the ability to push through any kind of social norms or fear of criticism or judgment or being bad. Well, Australians tend to follow the rules mm -hmm. and I don't like that at all. I've got what I'm calling the fuck you gene. Yeah. And it comes through my grandmother, through my father, me and our oldest daughter, who's got it in spades. And it, it's tough raising a teenage person with the fuck you gene. But basically what we what we say is authority doesn't know anything and we're going to challenge it. And that's why I'm a scientist, because I like to disprove people. Australians do tend to rebel because, yeah, convicts screw the British. It's mm -hmm. kind of the Americans and Australians very similar that way, except we didn't have religion over powering everything. Fascinating. So I just, the fact that I'm seeing you in person is even more surreal because you do actually look 22. And you know how sometimes you go to like a dentist and their teeth are crooked and you're like, hmm, I don't know about this. Or like you see like an out of shape doctor. You're like, you walk the walk in a way that is so compelling. Thanks. It's been very expensive plastic surgery. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, you can't see. <laughs> so how have you gotten younger in this past decade? We know about the supplements you're taking. I mean, obviously recap. Um, but... Do you feel younger, not only look younger? And what's the difference? Is there one? Uh, you can look younger, but not feel younger. Mm -hmm. But that's not what I'm about. It's all about extending your body's health mm -hmm. and then living longer because of it. Because you don't die if you're unhealthy, unless you choose to. Right. So as long as you've got friends and you're, you're healthy and happy, even if you're 100 years old, you don't want to die, despite what we might think about when we're 100. But I feel younger than I ever have. I can't remember feeling this good. Um, I'm not going to take my shirt off, but I... I don't think I've aged that much since I was in my I've 20s. I've seen you with your shirt off. Thumbs up. <laughs> We're not supposed to talk about that. <laughs> Sorry. I was a photo. It no, was a photo from seriously. the sauna. It was a Next photo from the sauna. Next talk about the dick pic. <laughs> <laughs> it was for science. <laughs> so what do you do to stay young on a daily basis? Uh, well, if there was one thing I would say has made a big impact, it's to eat less and less often. Yes. So not starvation, we're not talking malnutrition here, mm -hmm. but we don't need to eat three meals a day mm -hmm. with snacks in between. This old idea of you shouldn't be hungry and that stresses the body, that's a bunch of BS. Right. The science says that we, we evolved to be hungry part of the time, mm -hmm. and that turns on our body's defenses against disease and aging. So I've, I, I barely have ever eaten a breakfast in my life. Um, I do eat lunches occasionally, but try to avoid them. Mm -hmm. And then I have a pretty decent dinner. And I think it's a great way to live. And some of the misinformation that we've gotten is eat little snacks a day to keep your metabolism going. If you don't eat enough, your metabolism's going to slow down. Is that just, we've all just been lied to? Yes. No, really. Uh, and we've studied this in my lab and others have done this too. When you restrict your calories, your metabolism actually speeds up. Oh, wow. Yeah, there are little battery packs. You've heard of mitochondria. You've mm -hmm. read my book. You know what they are. You get more of those when you're hungry mm -hmm. and they speed up. Uh, and so I feel more energetic than I ever have. And I actually, if I start to eat again, if mm -hmm. I if I had three meals a day, I couldn't think straight. I've done it a few times. I had a, unfortunately, with, I went out with my son and I had this, what was it, chicken fried chicken burger. And for three days I felt sick. It got stuck in my digestion. So I don't want to go back to that. I love the feeling of just being fit. And I don't feel hungry. That's the misconception. People mm. go, oh, you know, I don't, if I eat, miss breakfast or lunch, I'm going to be thinking about food. It's true for the first two weeks that right. you have this addiction to put stuff in your mouth. It's but once you're over that, almost it is really or a is. scarcity complex for me, like growing up, because there's also, is there, what is there 
you know, in terms of discussing like scarcity complex, like if someone wants to achieve this goal of not eating breakfast and lunch because it's better for your longevity, like there are some emotional obstacles to some of this, maybe not for you necessarily, but like I grew up in a household where I kind of never knew what I was going to eat next. Like there wasn't a lot in the fridge. So in my head, if I see food, I have to eat it all. And then I have to have more backup for later because I never know what I'm going to eat again, you know? And that's, you know, I think something that's worth uh, sort of discussing here is like a lot of the, if you want to achieve a lot of the goals that your research has proven to help you live longer, there are also some emotional obstacles that people are going to have to do on their own and some reprogramming from their childhood and their trauma. Yes. For it sure. might not be easy, but you have to figure out why you feel the need to self-soothe with food or cope with food. For sure. And I'm not perfect. I, I still go to the fridge at night and I want a snack. It takes some willpower to try not to. Sometimes I fail. I mm -hmm. recently developed a Twizzler addiction. So that's that's not helpful. <laughs> the licorice ones, they're really addictive. I'm obsessed with licorice. Yeah. Very few people I, like licorice. But it's poisonous. Do you know that? It's just last year someone died from a licorice overdose. Are so, you sure it was the licorice? Yeah, yeah. Like over six weeks, this guy. Was it the root of licorice that killed him? Yeah, the extract of licorice. There's a but poison in there. Okay, I'm such a... Okay, so I'm a comedian. I'm not a scientist. Shocker. This might come as, you know, a surprise to you, but I do not have a PhD in biology. But, you know, comedians, we like to think like, not devil's advocate, but we like to sort of look at something from every point of view and we're the annoying people that are like, but what about this? And and I'm going to be wrong every time is my guess, but this is how I think. Like when I think about supplements, right? So you're taking vitamin D. I'm saying this right. Resveratrol. I have it. You might be the first person who ever pronounced that correctly. Impressive. Yes, I have it. I have it by Thorne. That's the brand I take. Okay. And then I, I take everything that you take. Why do you look younger than me? Um, but you know, when I think about, okay, someone that's on these supplements is going to be healthier, let's say, in five years after taking them. But isn't the kind of person that takes supplements already healthier because it's the kind of person who's probably not drinking and probably not smoking and is probably working out? How do we know the effects are from the supplement and not from the fact that the type of person that takes supplements is probably healthier in general in other areas of their life? Well, there, there are two answers. One is we, we do this on mice initially and, okay. on, and then on. So we know that animals. they're not. And yeah, right. We're not drinking tequila or not. Yeah. At least as far as I know, when I look at them, there's no alcohol in the cage. Uh, but in, in my case, I lead a pretty crappy life. I don't do a ton of exercise. Mm -hmm. I hate running. Uh, I probably have more alcohol than, than you'd expect. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but still it, it's overcome by these other things that I'm doing. Uh, but yeah, there are plenty of things that you you could do that are bad for you. The, the worst is smoking. So yeah. I hope anyone who's listening who smokes, that'll that'll age you rapidly. We can measure age now and you can see it speeding up. Can I ask you a wild question about that? Like when I look at people that are smoking, when I look at the fact that we get really addicted to sugar, we love sugar, we want it, it gives us dopamine is, is my guess or endorphins or something. Are we hardwired on some level to like be suicidal <laughs> because of the way the things that we're attracted to or get the most pleasure out of are now so unhealthy? Does that mean that the that we've just evolved to no longer need the benefits of those addictions or those dopamine hits? At one point, being addicted to sugar probably served us very well because we were obsessed with finding that. But now we have food aplenty and available. So now that survival mechanism has backfired. Exactly. That's the problem with the modern world is that our brains want to have enough nutrition and food. So fat, sugar tastes good. And that helped because the reason to exist is to breed mm -hmm. uh, and to ensure the people who are related to you survive, you know, might be your step or your, your brother's kids, whatever. And so we evolved to love calories, mm -hmm. love sex, mm -hmm. put some sleep in there too. Right. But mostly it's, we've got these cravings. The problem is that our bodies didn't care about our bodies when we're 80. That right. Right. And so the only way to trigger those defenses is to go without and put your body in a state of perceived adversity. And so I really have turned my my brain into a sugar avoiding uh organ. Mm -hmm. So I if I eat anything sweet, it's actually I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but it would be an artificial sweetener, mm -hmm. which I still think is way less troublesome than actual sugar. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yet, sugar spikes are bad for you. And what that does is it, it tells your body, don't worry, 
times are good. Mm -hmm. Don't have to fight aging. Don't have to fight disease. Mm -hmm. um, same with sitting around like we do in front of computer screens. That feels good. We watch movies, eat popcorn, but that's the worst you could do for long-term survival. It's not too bad if you just want to breed and die early. And um, the name of my next book. Um, <laughs> And then I'm thinking about what you're saying, and and as someone that is, you know, whether it's inherited, whether it's genetic, whether it's epigenetic, whether it was my conditioning, whether it was my parenting, whether it was nature and nurture, whatever it is, you know, um, or just the hard wiring of a hypervigilant person or being, I'm obsessed with the night watcher theory of the people that are now insomniacs because perhaps, you know, thousands of years ago in tribes, there were people that stayed up all night and they bred with each other and kind of some of us just at midnight or all of a sudden super awake and have and can sleep during the day. And is that, you know, um, is that, are we vestiges of that? Who knows? But, um, but everything I'm hearing about that's healthy. My question is like, so if I'm in the airport and my options are to not eat, forget the skipping meals. This is my one meal. It's dinner or to eat something unhealthy with a bunch of sugar is the stress of not eating worse for me, like the production of cortisol and the perseverating in the brain and the self-loathing and the guilt and the shame. Is that worse for me than just eating the quote unquote unhealthy thing? Well, you, if you obsess that much, maybe, but for a normal person, it, it's way worse to eat the food. Interesting. Uh, there was a great experiment um, at the NIH. They took 10,000 mice and they gave them different diets more protein, more fat, more sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turned out it didn't matter what they ate, it was when they ate. And so the stress of being hungry for those, these mice actually helped them. Wow. So putting your body under uh, intentional stress to uh, prolong life and health, like you talk extensively about cold sauna, we know all this. I remember listening to you, the heat shock proteins. I have a sauna. I started doing sauna because of you, changed my life. I'm Benjamin Button now. But is there anything to be said about emotional adversity or emotional stress in terms of, because from what I understand, if you can't get a hold of it, that's something that can shorten your lifespan and damage your life and perhaps your DNA. Is there any benefit to emotional stress? And is there even a little really bit. a difference? So this term hormesis means what doesn't kill you makes you stronger mm -hmm. or live longer in this case. Mm -hmm. So my, my work is really stressful, uh, but I manage it. I used to freak out, um, but I was, I found myself also getting older. I could see it. You look what happens to presidents. It's not a secret. Wild. But you have to take control. It, so excitement, a little bit of stress is good. But if you overdo it, this is, this is the problem. Same with anything. Mm -hmm. If you starve, you die. If you run too far, your joints wear out. Mm -hmm. If you don't sleep, you're in trouble. But if you do a little bit of that stuff, right. enough to make your body freak out a little bit, even emotional stress can be good for you, right. but not too much. So the other problem with the word stress is it means different things. Emotional stress is different than biological stress, body stress. Right. Not being, not having enough food, biological stress, that's different than emotional stress. Cortisol you mentioned? Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned. Yeah. Cortisol is really bad over time. Long it's term. what your uh, your body emits when you're under duress, when right. you produce adrenaline, basically, and it help it makes you hold fat around your midsection, right? It yes, uh, that's true. <laughs> you're impressing me. Um, so I, I I used to keep fish aquarist, I think we call it. I'm fish. I keep fish. Yeah. Okay. I used to, and you could tell the difference between the fish that was happy and the one that was picked on because it the one that was picked on would be not just small but sick and dark and would right. die young you don't want to be that fish mm -mm. Uh, you want to you don't have to be the dominant jerk in life but you do want to try and get through life without worrying so uh, i give my men i'm a mentor to a lot of young kids mm -hmm. and I, one of the things i tell them is just live every day as though it's your last mm. um, but don't be pessimistic act as though you've got a million more to come and focus on the present mm -hmm. and what come will come we're all going to die anyway right sorry everybody Plot but twist. that's the truth right we're not going to live forever but just enjoy being alive uh you know i was if, on lex friedman's podcast mm -hmm. came out just the other day and he asked me about this and i said i'm so happy to be alive because you know, for those of you listening i'm holding up a coaster i met a this is a, a stone coaster yes the difference between me and this thing is massive right this thing will never be alive it's never going to be happy it'll never enjoy life when i wake up 
I'm excited that I'm not this coaster. I'm I'm this living thing that can do things. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds corny, but I really do live my life like that. And the stress goes away when you realize how cool it is to just be here. But what blows my mind is that being neurotic, being a person that worries served us really well for thousands of years. The most anxious, worried person was probably the one with the highest probability of living for the longest time, right? What's that noise? What's this? We shouldn't eat this berry. We ate this berry last time and it didn't go well. Like what's that in the bushes? Like that probably served us really well. And we did we evolve to be sort of uh, uh, have the ultimate advantage being that we were hypervigilant and worried all the time. And now all of a sudden, because there's less predators, we get to have locks on our doors. We've got mace. We've got police officers. Now, all of a sudden, that <laughs> right. just makes us sick instead of protects us and helps it does, us. It does. But um, what you want to do is be around people who are stressed out and let them worry about it because they're going to die younger than you and you'll just get the benefit. So these people that are obsessed with success and worry, right. let them do all the hard work and then you can just benefit from them. Right. You can imagine in, in the old days, Let's say you're in a village and there are people who are just stressed out all the time. They're inventing the bow and arrow and fire and all that. That's great, but they weren't the ones that probably lived the longest. The people who live the longest, it's a fact, are those that have a good sense of humor, mm. don't stress. These are people that rarely get sick hmm. um, and uh, often drink red wine every day. Can I, can, I, can I ask you a question about that? So, you know, and I guess we don't know this in mice and then I have so many questions to get to, but- is there anything to be said for thinking about something, and I guess there's no way to quantify this, thinking about something and exacerbating the negative effects by thinking about it? Now, I, I have no scientific data for this, but if I feel a sniffle or feel something sick going on, if I ignore it, it will not get worse. Mm -hmm. This is what I believe. And if I go, I'm sick, I don't feel well, I will get sicker. And I feel like I like manifest it, you know? I don't know if that's science, maybe, it's not as bad as I thought, and I didn't stop it with my brain power. It just went away, and I didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. But in my head, whenever I succumb to being sick, I get it's like I give my body permission or something. Mm -hmm. Like, is there anything to be said about about being conscious of all this? But if we think about it too much, is that manifesting the opposite effect? Well, you can definitely will yourself into health. That it's called the placebo effect, mm -hmm. right? I'm gonna cure you. I'm gonna lay my hands on you. Get better. Yeah. And often people do. It's called a chiropractor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we have plenty of these charlatans in Hollywood. Uh, yeah, just offended a million people. That's great. Is there? A, that's my brand. <laughs> um, are there placebo effects in genetics? Oh wow! Uh, yes. There are, but it doesn't change your genome. It changes the control systems, the epigeno epigenome. Hmm. And uh, yeah, that's what placebo is doing. It's changing which genes get turned on and off. Mm -hmm. So if I just tell you that you're a superwoman, you think you are, mm -hmm. and that'll turn on genes that will help you. Like uh, if you smile during exercise, you get stronger and you're less tired. Is that true? I think so. Oh, I better try that. Yes. Because I'm, I'm miserable. <laughs> yes, apparently if you smile, it activates like um, endorphins and you have then more energy. If you listen to an amazing song, if you listen to Eye of the Tiger, you're going to run faster. But you told me you cry when you exercise. I sometimes cry when I exercise. When did I tell you that? <laughs> How did you, did I really admit that? Mm. There are times in when I was in the spin class when they would turn the lights off. Emily's done it with me and they would play, you know, like uh, the Lannis Morissette song. And when you're just working so hard something would happen where i would just release emotion it was pretty embarrassing to look at but the great thing is you're sweating so much that people uh, don't know if it's tears or sweat like it's the perfect place to like cry in public and nobody really knows good but smile while you're doing it yeah exactly yeah mm -hmm. oh that's it i mean that's my whole thing smile through tears that's called being in hollywood baby um there's a lot i want uh to get to is, are there any updates on the NAD front? You are a strong NAD proponent. You even give it to your dogs, and I'm going to start this week. Giving it to your dogs? Is yes. Okay. Uh, t talk to my brother about that. He's working on that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, there's a, there's a lot to update you on. Unfortunately, you haven't published it, and I can't tell you. Oh, my gosh. I'm kidding. What would happen? A dart just hits you in the neck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, d 
Does everyone know what NAD is? Do you want me to talk I about believe it? so. Why don't you just recap it and keep going while I uh, clean this up? <laughs> Can I get a towel? I just, you know what's so annoying about it is that I had this and I was like, I cannot drink a coffee with milk and sugar in it in front of David Sinclair. And I did it anyway. And I put it here and I was like, who do you think you are drinking this right in front of him saying F you to all, to have lifespan next to this, to go, this is my favorite book on the planet and I'm drinking a milk milky sugary coffee with a plum mm. in front of you and then of course i had to knock it over it was like the universe was like we're not gonna let you do that it's just it's too arrogant yeah no, so that, i just knocked over my sugary karma. coffee yeah mm -hmm. i think you just did that like his is it, it being around you it panicked he used the force yeah, yeah molecules start to panic that are sugar molecules <laughs> they just want to get away from you so excuse me i just see i this is what happened i wear a nice shirt to try to impress my hero and then i spill all over it this is why mommy can't have yeah, nice things i can wet myself and then wear it even what do you <laughs> <laughs> you are competitive. <laughs> I am wetter than you now. I, you're like, uh -oh. I, I, you're like, I will be dead. Now, now we're in a wet t-shirt contest. But Wait, now you can see this thing under my shirt. Oh my God. Okay. Plot twist. What's that? Okay. You are a robot. I knew it. I am. It, yep. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm a cyborg. Becoming a cyborg, Did actually. Did Lex program you on his podcast? What's happening? Uh, this is a little, uh, can you see it flashing? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what? Thank you so much. What is it? And can I have it even if I have fake boobs? Uh, well, you could stick it on yourself right now. What does it do? It tells it's, it's a biosensor. Okay. Tell me everything. All right. So we'll get back to NAD, I assume. But is pouring water on it going to make it catch on fire well, we, like a weight luggage? I, I don't think it's supposed to get wet, actually. Oh, no. It might you, electrocute can we get me. get him another shirt. Can we get him a shirt? A, a, a merch, preferably the merch. <laughs> Can we get him a shirt? Because now his his bio device is wet with this water, oh, and he's no. I swear I didn't spill on him. He's I spilled on myself, and then to, he's Australian, so he's nice. And to try to make me feel less embarrassed, he just doused himself with water, and it probably is infiltrating his bio tracking device. You should never get them wet. I'm in trouble. It's, I hope this is a million dollars. This well, thing. no, no, they're not. No, no okay, <laughs> but wouldn't you sweat in them, or you don't wear them when you're in the sauna? I wear it always. And where is the data that's in it going? going. Uh, I, it goes to my phone and then it gets uploaded to a company that monitors me to see if I'm sick or not. Okay. So they can see everything that I'm doing, unfortunately. Sick as in how? What could it pick up that would indicate that you're sick? Heart rate? Well, it goes heart rate, body temperature, movement, sleep, vibrations, breathing. Okay. So Soon it'll be glucose levels, sugar levels. Really? Yeah. So- Everyone has access to this. I know about the aura ring. Excuse me. It's a ring. <laughs> this, this one. <laughs> yes. Oh, is that the aura ring? Yes. Okay. So I had the aura ring, but I got annoyed at charging it. I just couldn't. I just couldn't. Right. You have to remember. Every I wasn't day. ready. It also goes right on the ring finger. I'm not ready for commitment on any level, especially not a tracking device. <laughs> I will not get married to something I have to charge. I can't, I'm not taking you on any new charger. Put it on your middle finger. That'd be appropriate. Isn't there, isn't there something to be, oh, it does fit there. Isn't there something to be said for going, okay, it would be healthier to do this, but if I do it in a way that's stressed out and adrenalized and crazed and frazzled, it's yeah. going to undo all the health benefits of it. If it's a little bit of stress, you're okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. But if it's me, I'm like, I lost my aura ring. I yeah. don't know where it is. It's on That's the plane. That's the problem. I, I didn't sleep. Yeah. I spent $400. I can't even find it. It's not uploading. Wow. Like, I, I, it was causing me so much more stress than it yeah. was curing. The aura and ring is not for you. My childhood. I need to work on that. You, you do. You need more than a ring. And also, I felt judged because I, I also was not peak. This was after I had COVID and I was not in peak shape. And it was like minimal unimpressive activity like it's a little judgy the way that it gives you <laughs> feedback it's like you don't know if i'm handicapped that could have been like a huge deal that i walked those 22 steps it could have been a miracle quite frankly i could have gotten out of a chair that i was paralyzed in i could have literally just executed a miracle and you went mm, low Good. performance today right right you could have you could have been having sex all night and that judges you didn't get enough sleep. Yes. Yeah, it's not fair. No, I sleep during sex, so that would have been perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm putting your aura ring. This is something that tracks your pulse, your temperature. I just put it on my finger. Is it going to ruin all your stats? I feel like your doctor is going to call in 20 minutes and be like, "You need to could well stop th drinking this so one. Much this coffee. one will, will cause issues." Okay, so if I put that on me right now, 
and it tracked my body data, your doctor would just immediately Yeah, oh my call God, you. you're having a heart attack. <laughs> You've, you've suddenly become sick. <laughs> you're diabetic. You're full of sugar. Yeah. Um, and why are you doused uh, yeah. in so many liquids? We do have another shirt for you if you want it. Do you want to put this on? You don't. Switch shirt. Yes. Oh, I, my gosh. I'm totally going to put on your. What's it called? A, a bi bio tracker. A, bi a, this one's called a bio button. A bio button. Okay. Rip it off. Here. Let's go. Careful. Be careful, please. It's going to be covered in hair. Okay. No, I mean, look, I'm about to add. Oh, my God. This is okay. such a weird it really hurts to kink. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. My boobs are numb because they're fake, so I won't feel it. Oh, it looks like those tiles. Remember, the, you know the tiles that helps you find your phone and stuff? This is like a tile for a human. There is a little bit of blood on it. Did you? There is? <laughs> Did you just rip that? Do you see any? I hope I hope you're okay over there. Okay. D um, okay. I'm going to... Is it sticky? Stick it near your heart. It okay. should be sticky. Okay. The heart's in the I, middle, right? It's usually. <laughs> Depends. How many hearts do you have? You know, so you know when you're a kid, you like do the national anthem and stuff, and you think your heart's like here. It's more like here. It's pretty central, a bit to the left. Okay. If you're it's... an octopus, I think you have three. Oh, uh, don't you have one for each leg if you're an octopus? Or a brain for each leg. It's a brain. Yeah. Should I just come teach at Harvard? I feel like I'm ready. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, you can come teach instead of me. Okay, hold on. No, mine's not sticking. I think it's because I'm also so oily. I, I lube myself up in grapeseed oil every day. So I don't know if it's going to stay on. Do I have to hold it? Okay, I'm holding it. Okay, Is it okay that I have si a giant thing, bag of silicone in between this and my heart? Is that going to be a problem? Try to go to the middle. Is this going to bake my boobs? Yeah. What uh, if my boobs just pop because of the... There you go. Hit the button. The Bluetooth. And it'll sync and okay. you'll get a green light. Okay. Okay, does everyone see it? There we go. Oh my God, I feel like E.T. <laughs> E.T. phone home. My heart light's on. All right. My, my phone's <laughs> going to ring off the hook now. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so I'm connected to your device. You are. I, They're going to think that you've you. got kidnapped <laughs> and have been forced to ride a roller coaster <laughs> for like 17 times in a row. It'll send me an alert, that's for sure, because oh, things no. have suddenly changed. They're just writing your obituary now. <laughs> Wait, so get to the hospital but right why? now. I can't even get it to stick on my skin. Is that a problem? Uh, you can get extra stickers. Do you want to? I can get an extra sticker for you. You wear this all day, every day? Yep. Okay. Yep. And you see the data? Yeah. And how do you feel when you see the data? Does it inspire you to change your choices or it's just an affirmation of, yeah, I did, nailed it. I was right. Uh, it's a bit of both. It, it's more just make sure that I'm, uh, I'm not going to have a heart attack next week because, um, was it Sebastian Younger on um, on Joe's podcast? Yeah. He was he almost died, and he said, "What can we do? We're going to die tomorrow. We'll never know." That's not true. You will know. Hmm. That thing will tell you if you're going to die, and you'll get to the hospital before you have a heart attack. Does anything like this? I'm just. This is a a question that probably can't be answered, and it's probably just like an interesting, weird, masturbatory discussion. But is there anything to be said in terms of if we live to be two hundred? Mm -hmm. Maybe we're going to get married. How's that going to change our behavior in terms of taking life for granted and not having a, a bookend to sort of arrange your life around? I need to get married this time. I need to procreate it this time. I need to pick a career by this time. Like the sort of psychological effects we're going to have. It's like, oh, I'll deal with that later. I'll deal with that later. I have all the time in the world. Yeah. I'm not going to settle. Will we stop procreating? Who knows? Like the psychological effect of... I know I'm not going to die tomorrow because I know on this thing I'm not going to have a heart attack. I'm not going to have a stroke. Is there anything to be said for being like, so I'm just going to walk through traffic. That, will you take more risks other place in your life because you feel comfortable? I.e. the theory of like how most car accidents happen five minutes from home because you're like comfortable. Oh, because you live near your home and that's where it's going to happen? Right. Yes. Okay. But then you just move. Yeah. That, <laughs> that's how to save your if life. that's a problem, that, just move to a new house. I can get you another sticky. I, yeah, I don't, but I don't want to mess up your algorithm. What if you start getting marketed like, you know, I don't know, menopause drugs or something? Like, does this connect to your computer? Are you you need start more getting, testosterone. Are you start getting targeted ads for like birth control? Like, you should not conceive a child. Please go on this birth control immediately. Like, what's going to happen? Are you just going to start being sent ginkgo biloba? Your memory sucks. We can tell. We don't like any of what's going on in your body anymore. Too much estrogen. Yeah, yeah. it's just going to be... <laughs> Just gonna be sending you Centrum Silver like <laughs> pop up ads. <laughs> this can't be good. We'll see. It's a good experiment. Just free metformin trial. Okay, so but yeah, so, like, okay. there's no way to really quantify the other effects that this could have psychologically. You mean? Yeah, that's true. So I've got I've thought about this. Okay. Okay. 
the agency in life, I think, doesn't matter how long you live. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to enjoy being here just as much as if I'm going to, you know, live for a thousand years or die tomorrow. That I think is is actual bullshit. That that the longer you live, the less excited you are about life. And it's also, it comes from within. And it's also there's such an interesting sort of. Um, irony is probably not even the word. I know that word is often misused, but the idea that you know you're not going to die tomorrow because of this device that you wear, but your philosophy is also live like you're going to die tomorrow. <laughs> exactly. That's the trick. Right. It's just like it's a fascinating two things being true at once yeah, thing. Yeah. But the longer you live, you're definitely going to worry about crossing the road more. Sure. That is true. Is that more because, not because you're necessarily frail and couldn't heal as well if you were hit? Is it more the idea of like, I've... I've had too many uh, lives. Like I've, I'm due. Do you know what I mean? I don't believe in that. I, I think that what what you want to do because life, be longer life makes life more valuable. If you go back a hundred years, people would take a lot of risks. Now, because we live so long, right? You know, we wear helmets. Some of us we try to drive well. Some of us. But isn't it interesting that wearing a helmet? Like I think about just how how confusing humans are in terms of our motives and the things that we normalize and the things that we've minimized the risk of just because we do it so much and we've gotten away with it so much we forget how dangerous things are if you're putting a helmet on to do something you already shouldn't do it <laughs> do you know what i'm saying the idea that we're like it's safe now it's like no you're already putting yourself in danger if you're putting the helmet on right. where it's we like go to skydiving with a helmet yeah that's gonna help you can still break all your bones and not your brain on the motorcycle but the idea that we're like okay we're, we're gonna play football with helmets on so now we're safe whereas helmet is what causes the most it's true they use it rugby, as a weapon they don't wear helmets typically well they used to in football the injuries are increasing because they're using the helmet as weapons and there's a false sense of safety if i can hit my head i'm wearing a helmet so there's just something about like like these things that are supposed to protect us actually sort of give us the green light to put ourselves in even more dangerous situations. It makes no sense. Right. Well, things like that on my body make me love life even more. I, I don't want life to end. I'm having a great time. And I also think there's just like the greatest tragedy of life that the people that are the wisest technically have the least amount of time. Like I look, I go, my mom's in a nursing home and I, I go around and I don't ask any of my girlfriends for advice because I love you all, but girlfriends that love you give you the worst advice, right? The guy doesn't call. Maybe he likes you too much. What? Maybe his phone's off. Maybe he's scared because he just has such a deep connection with you. He's scared of how much he loves you. Like <laughs> well, maybe he's on a plane. Yeah, they have Wi-Fi on planes. Like what, you know, <laughs> sometimes you just need someone to like come in with that sort of like hard thing um but uh i just i don't know i was going on a tangent about how that fascinates me about how we you know i think when i go to nursing homes i will like knock on an eight-year-old woman's door and i'm like what does this text mean and she'll go oh yeah he doesn't like you like, <laughs> you just have wisdom that <laughs> it, i'm like what if you die soon there's all this incredible wisdom in your brain do exactly we, that, do we upload it to the cloud that's why i don't want people to suffer or die young all, older people are hugely valuable, hugely to to the world. We send to them the out families. to pasture in this culture, but it's like this it's is really um, sad. Yeah. Imagine where we would be technologically if pe brilliant people weren't dying at 70, 80. Right. Well, my father's eighty one and he's as fit as a twenty, thirty year old, and he's contributing to society. He's looking after grandkids. He started a new career at seventy six, mm -hmm. dating a bunch of women. It, it, he's living life, but. That could be for everybody. He's a role model for what life can be like in your 80s. And is this, is it, he's specifically this healthy and going to live so much longer because you're his son? Or uh, is this just a coincidence? Well, his, our family typically doesn't live more than 70 something years old, um, years. So he's an outlier. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see. You never know. I mean, we call it an N of one experiment, which means it's, it's not going to tell you anything. But I do think that uh, it's not hurting him what he's doing. And he's, doing basically what I do. Right. He's been, he's a scientist, so he can read my papers. He oh, makes wow. It, I don't say, dad, you got to do this. Mm -hmm. He's a grown man, but he does believe in it mm -hmm. and he's been doing it and his friends are getting old and he's not. Fascinating. And then it, it, are there certain things you can do when you're older that uh, stop damage to your genes that like is a, ma besides smoking or whatever, uh, that is like a major thing that a lot of people are missing? 
to be better or worse? To avoid, like things so, that we just do to damage our genes in a lackadaisical right. way. Like yeah. I was listening to you talk about x-rays and how damaging x-rays are yeah. to uh, our DNA, right? Our DNA, our, our genes, yep. our cells, our cells. Now you were right on all three. I'm the best. Mm. Even when I'm wrong, I'm right. <laughs> it's like, un it's a gift. No, but, but the older you get, the more x-rays you'll probably need. That's wrong. <laughs> I mean, that makes sense to me. Older people hurt their ankle more. They got to get oh. an MRI. They got to get an x-ray. The more, the older you are, the higher the chances that you've had an x-ray. That's true. But I would rather have an MRI than an x-ray. So MRI doesn't do the same damage to cells. Right. X-rays sure. do. Why do we not have an ability to x-ray people when they're injured or hurt without damaging their cells? Why isn't anyone- Because x-ray machines are cheaper than MRIs. That's the reason. But x-rays- trash your DNA. It, and if we how, do that to a mouse, it ages rapidly. How much? One x-ray? Five? One's not going to kill you, but if you do it consistently, it's a lifetime accumulation. All I know is that when I go in for an x-ray, and I'm going to talk about my mammogram story in a second, because I feel like when I went in for, I went in for my first mammogram, and the woman, and there, it's digital now, and then there's like an x-ray. Maybe it's because my boobs are fake. They had to do an additional thing to look for it or some under it. It was like a whole nightmare. They had to like take them off and put them back on. It was a whole thing. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I go in there and the woman, because I've always been fascinated. I just thought it was my comedian brain about when you go in for an x-ray, they put a giant metal cape on you that doesn't cover your head and only covers your body. Why are you putting one on my head? I don't like the fact that I'm wearing this cape to begin with. This Again, this feels like the helmet thing. It feels like I just shouldn't be doing this at all if I right. need this. And then they run away. Sprint. Yeah. They run out of the room yeah. and duck and lock the door. Yeah. And it's dangerous stuff. They don't want to be near it. Like, why am I in here? If you're if you if you're not casually walking out this door, if you're sprinting out this door and like ducking. Yeah. Obviously, this isn't a good business model. Right. It's so not, we got to so go dentists, back to square one. It's not ready for market. Right. I, I have big fights with doctors and dentists uh, who want to x-ray me. Now, you you do need an x-ray once in a while. Otherwise, you can't see if you've got cavities. But this every year giving me, I don't do that. I've had big fights with my dentist that you're not going to x-ray me. And they basically say, well, it's all on you. Don't come to us if you get a cavity. Fine. But like, I don't need sugar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, right. But but I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, you need to pay for the machine that you just bought. Yeah, that's why you want to keep x-raying me. Yeah. And I don't have any pain. I don't have any issues. So I try to avoid x-rays. I try to avoid cosmic rays as much as I can, which are up in, high up in the altitudes. Are these like EMFs? Like cosmic uh, rays? No, these are mostly... Um, particles because that cosmic rays sounds like a dj at coachella like you have to understand a lot of these terms that you use in science yeah. the way they trickle down normal people are like <laughs> bands and like so you know what i mean so when i hear cosmic i just think of fiction you good, know good name from a band yeah right? totally cosmic or like rays. we have this cosmic connection like i think of like astrology and things that you know what i mean that are not scientific so okay the sun is spewing out particles that if you don't get protected by the atmosphere it'll damage your DNA, mm -hmm. and damaging your DNA accelerates the aging process. Yes. That is a fact. Um, so I avoid, I try not to fly too much, but I have to. Okay, so this is what I want to talk about. Because, the, but the x-ray really quick, another thing that happened to me when I was doing the uh, x-ray mammogram, the woman walked up to me with the metal cape, and she just looked at me and she went, are you going to have kids? Oh, no. And I was like, I think. I think I probably, I think so. And she just went, oh, let's just put it on anyway, regardless. Like, she wasn't going to put it on me because I hadn't had right. kids yet and I was in my late 30s. You can get ovarian cancer. What's the problem? But then also, why do I even need this at all? Let's not do this at all, whether I have kids or <laughs> yeah, not. Right. Even if I don't have kids, I don't want these rays in my ovaries. I have to carry them around. Like, it's obviously bad enough to where you were like, if you're going to have a kid, we're going to put this metal over your uterus. Yeah, it, it's really bad there's a lot of things we do in our lives that are crazy craziness i'm and just getting sunburnt like i did yesterday over at gabby and uh you know Laird laird's Johnson's. place yeah. yeah but let me ask you but you have this punk rock uh you know sort of not disrespect for authority but the ability to question authority. most people they think doctors know way more than I, how who am i to question a doctor like if you're going to give me an extra obviously this is safe or else someone would have put a stop to it no one would just be bombarding 
my uterus with something that is carcinogenic or else there would be some authority that would stop it. Like, it just doesn't occur to me to think wh when you go to the doctor to get healed, you would ever get sick at the doctor. Well, doesn't make sense. Yeah. Well, doctors are only human and they mm -hmm. can only store a certain amount of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And they, it's very hard to keep up to date with the science. They're mm -hmm. usually 10 years behind actual knowledge. I work at Harvard Medical School, so I have to say some of my best colleagues and friends are doctors. <laughs> but but my physician- um, Laughter's the best medicine, I'll say, so yeah. I'm also a doctor. Should I say- <laughs> I'll give you a PhD. Come I don't know lab. if you guys know this, but laughter is the best medicine. I know you guys are working on a lot of like antibiotics and stuff. Slows but aging. Have you seen my stand-up special? <laughs> Dude, Let's that. talk about medicine. We now are taking a break of this incredibly insightful, informative, life-changing, earth-shattering interview with Dr. David Sinclair to talk about fashion um, and how good I am at it. It's no surprise that I'm a fashion icon. I want to let you know that my we... taste is flawless. My instincts mm. perfect. Well, we brought everyone here. Many of for... say I'm the next Anna Wintour. Okay. Well, I want to let you know that we brought everyone here because this is an intervention. Mm. Everything Whitney wears looks like she pulled it from the funeral of a Muppet. Oh. This is a video that um, I think will be informative. It's you celebrating my fashion instincts? Yeah, I just thought this would be a good, this is a good showcase of why you need Stitch Fix and mm -hmm. why you need a, a company that is going to style you. I love Stitch you. Fix. We signed you up, so. And I think this, this will show you why. Oh, hello. Like Whitney Cummings, does your closet also look like a secondhand store? Is it filled with patterns and prints that even even the worst of the fabric stores wouldn't sell? Even Joanne said, no thanks. Here's the thing, I buy pieces that spark joy. They don't match anything else and I keep them yeah, in but case. But some of your clothes have to match, which is where Stitch Fix is really helpful because the stylist will pick you things that go together and just mail it right to your house. Why would icon, celebrity legend Whitney Cummings need a service like Stitch Fix? Well, let us show you. Clothing like this. She's 37. <laughs> Many of you don't know this, but Whitney Cummings in her free time also works as a cabana boy <laughs> at casinos all over the nation. Where are you dealing blackjack? <laughs> Wait, that is a tiger print pajama top slash like Bahama vibe. Every time I wear it. You should be arrested just like the Tiger King. <laughs> Every time I wear it, people try to buy drugs for me. Stitch Fix would never send you that. They no. would never send you that shirt <laughs> because their stylists hand select things based on the quiz you take. And nowhere on the quiz does it say, you want to look stupid? <laughs> Do you want no one to ever lend you money? Yeah. Wear this top. You want someone to close their eyes as they pass you in the street? <laughs> Do you want to lose that court case? Wear this shirt. <laughs> the thing about Whitney Cummings and her fashion is that she doesn't dress to impress. She dresses to depress. Because every time I see her, I want to kill myself. Okay, I see your point. So with Stitch Fix, you take a quiz. Which you I took did it for you. Okay. It was quick, easy. Ask me a couple questions. You know, uh, how much do you spend on tops? How much do you spend on dresses? How much do you spend on shoes? Where do you shop? What's your sizes? What mm. do you like? Gave me a couple options, literal visual options of would you wear this? Would you not wear this? And then they build this intelligent... Uh, kind of system so that their stylists know what to package you, send it to your house, you keep what you want, you send back what you don't, and it comes out of your Stitch Fix styling budget. And you only pay $20 styling fee for each box. This is like, I don't have class or taste. So this is, I'm basically, all I'm doing is paying $20 for the styling fee for each box, which is, gets credited towards pieces you keep, and there are no hidden fees. It there's seems too reason, good to be true. There's a reason being a stylist is a job. <laughs> <laughs> so they offer clothing hand selected by expert stylists for your unique size, style, and budget. Also, I can't try things on. I, I can't like they just handle all of it for you, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Get started today at stitchfix.com slash Whitney, and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash Whitney for 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Stitchfix.com slash Whitney. Don't dress like Whitney, just use your code. You know, I'm not proud of this, but it's no secret that the Good For You team, we're a filthy bunch. We're a stinky bunch. <laughs> we put ourselves in disgusting situations. This is why we have a company mandate that everyone must have native body wash and native deodorant at all times. I put dogs 
on my face. We roll around in pig bogs uh, on a on a work day. And no one needs more native body wash or shower gel or deodorant than the good for you team. I lay around with horses. I, I, we have Ooh, cake fights. fights. We have food fights constantly. We are in a constant state of ma- so- filth. soiling <laughs> ourselves for your entertainment. And native body wash is the only thing that keeps us clean. I'm obsessed with the lavender and rose. That is the best my favorite body wash scent. They have lavender rose. Mm, I really like the peach nectar one. Oh, really? Because you are just a Because I'm just, I'm peach. just, just peach. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only thing that keeps us clean because also I have to wash my body so much that I can't use something that's super abrasive and, and not harsh natural and full of, yeah. or else I'm going to dry my skin out. And we know that my biggest nightmare in life is my skin being dry. I have to be lubed up at all times because that's what ages you is when you use abrasive things yeah. that destroy your skin. And my biggest nightmare is having a sunburn. And somebody <laughs> on this team thinks we're sunflowers. I am very. And has us outside face up to the sun. The Sun Care by Native is brand new. This is me locked out of a car for hours because who knows how to work a Tesla. <laughs> so you need sunscreen more than I have no than idea. Me. I definitely need it. I Emily, need- you have Emily editing a seven hour video by the pool and she's in a full suit or something. It is my duty as an employer to provide mineral health because sunscreen a lot of sunscreens have nasty chemicals and shit in them they're not and they hurt the environment a lot of them native made a sunscreen that is mineral sunscreen Mm -hmm. it is i'm obsessed with it the way that it smells is amazing it doesn't make you tear up when it gets in your eye it is like perfect the perfect sunscreen and i can subscribe to it i can have it shipped right to my house i don't have to go i don't have to you know go into target look around for it for hours as soon as i'm done with the bottle i have a new one at my door yeah. so i'm never i have no excuse to be filthy ever anymore and when i subscribe to it i save 25 percent. hellier so without further ado i'm just going to tell you that you need to stay fresh stay clean with native by going to native do deo.com slash Whitney, or use promo code Whitney at checkout and get 20% off your first order. That's nativedeo.com slash Whitney, or use promo code Whitney at checkout for 20% off your first order. So so let's talk about these the rays, because I think there's also a generalized anxiety that ages us when we're worrying about things that either we don't need to be worrying about mm-hmm. or that we can't control at all. So you've laid out so clearly in this book all the things that age you like physically. I'm sort of interested in the things we do mentally and emotionally. I know people that eat kale exclusively and eat healthier Mm -hmm. and very rigid about what they eat. They do yoga every day and they're not healthy people. They're sick people. They're neurotic. They're obsessive. They're, you know, you can sort of be doing physically healthy things and not necessarily be a healthy person. For sure. I mean, if you do just one good thing and the rest of your life, you know, you might eat kale, but you smoke, forget it. That's not going to help. If you, if you're obsessive and you're stressed, eating kale is not going to help you. The fact that human beings still smoke they know the side it's they know the side effects what is is that just an inherent is that an inherited ability to just be delusional is that a mental illness that someone would be doing that in this day and age as someone that like likes to smoke and would probably do it if i it didn't if it was make, healthy if i didn't think it was gonna make my lips old i do it's vanity <laughs> alone the only i just got i don't like doing the dry cleaning you just smell disgusting and then i don't want to get those lines around my lips and mm-hmm. or yellow nails otherwise i would totally do it but what how can so many humans smoke how do we explain that knowing it's killing them well it's called addiction but yeah. but there's also the people like to put stuff in their mouths uh, like to chew on stuff suck on stuff so my grandmother smoked for most of her life and when she quit, she still, for the rest of her life, had to put something in her mouth. Mm-hmm. Toothpick, something like that. She actually used, what are those, cigarette holders? She would Oh yeah. chew oh, on those glam. Yeah, so she didn't, good, then she probably didn't get the wrinkles or the life hack. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to smoke again. Those They still make those? <laughs> I'll get them in a vintage store. Yes, yeah, cigarette holder so that it's, yeah, but also that was back in the day when, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, um, contradicting myself because I'm obsessed with looking back at things doctors prescribed 50 years ago. Like, I mean, they used to prescribe smoking to pregnant women to calm down and relax. Sure. And heroin was great. A lot of things prescribed that now are toxic. There was this weight loss drug actually that in the 1920s that a lot of Dexit- people took. Oh. It was, uh, what is it called? DNP. Mm-hmm. And it was found, uh, it was actually part of a bomb 
uh, bomb chemicals. And the people who were making the bombs were very skinny. So they wow. figured out if you eat it, you lose a lot of weight. The problem is that it revs up the body so much, you basically overheat and die. So that led to what we now call the FDA. Wow. But uh, what we need is a pill like that that's safe, uh, which is, is another story, but that's something that I'm working on is to, to get that weight loss pill. But we're getting off track. If we had a cure for smoking, that you could just go like that, that would save millions, millions of lives just in the US. But, and I, I just, the, the addiction, I talk about a lot on this podcast as someone that is uh, uh, admittedly an addict. Uh, thankfully, I didn't get the substances. I got the perfectionism, the workaholism, um, the, you know, cleanliness like I have what I like to call like good addictions they weren't necessarily good addictions in my 20s until I was able to kind of uh alchemize them into benefiting me instead of destroying me and other people mm -hmm. um addiction to being liked having you know too many friends over exhausting myself with them going to this party and this dinner and this dinner which is an addiction looking back but because it's socially acceptable I no one would think to do an intervention on having too many friends or being too nice well yeah You've done all right, Miss. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, for me, for me. <laughs> so, but but you're getting better, right? You've learned to control it. I think so, but 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 when I think about addiction and how this is kind of the curveball in a lot of this, where people are like, okay, I'm addicted to alcohol. What is there any biological basis for addiction that? we're missing. I also think addiction, the way that you classify aging as a disease, a lot of people don't understand to classify addiction as a disease. They don't think that it, you know, gets progressive over time and needs to be treated and you can't stop it yourself. We think if you have Lyme disease, you're going to treat it. If you have Alzheimer's, you're going to treat it. If you have aging or addiction, people are like, I guess that's just who you are. That's really well put. Um, and just in the same way, aging is the disease, which is something that leads to sickness and eventually death if you don't mm. do something about it. Addiction is the same. But people are susceptible to it. A lot mm -hmm. of people, um, smokers, drug addicts. This is something that we're born with. It's not something we should, you know, vilify. Mm -hmm. And so you and you said something in, I believe, uh, I think it was on Rogan's podcast. Um, uh, you know, because I've always been told I'm in programs like Al-Anon and Codependence Anonymous, where you go in and just reprogram your brain, and, and so that you don't repeat the uh, cycles, the toxic cycles that you saw growing up in terms of how relationships should be, how people should be treated, how you should behave. If you saw parents fighting a lot, you think that's normal, and then mm -hmm. you're in these, you know, dating these pugnacious people, and then all these like cantankerous relationships that are just stressful because you just think it's normal, yeah. you know. Or I, you know, and this is something to talk about too. Sort of the addictions were. Born with, right? Like the same way you can be born addicted to Oxycontin or a crack baby that, you know, was popularized in the 80s, born addicted to it. You can also technically be born with like an adrenaline addiction if your mother in utero was stressed out and fighting a lot, right? And then right. I had this natural just comfort in drama. I felt alive in a time of crisis yeah. when I didn't have adrenaline or wasn't in something stressful or chaotic. I was actually scared because I was always waiting for the shoe to drop. I thrive in chaos. That's my comfort zone. Other people, it would stress them out. It stresses me out when there's not some kind of chaos because then I know the chaos is going to come and then I'm just waiting for the Damocles sword to drop. It explains a lot, actually. Now I understand you. <laughs> but but do you have ADHD or do you have a, what we'd call laser focused disease? I've been diagnosed with a litany of mental limitations. ADHD is one of them. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, but, but my you thing can is, become obsessed. And I don't have it with you because you're interesting. You're not obsessed with me? I am obsessed with you, but I'm not distracted by anything when I'm talking to you. So there's the laser focus. I think that that is the key to success, is that you do a lot of things, you're interested in a lot of things, you get bored, but when you need to do something, you really do I it. I don't get bored if something's not boring. So for me, this is sort of the issue, I think, with the way that there's so many flaws in the way that we teach kids. Every kid learns differently. If a kid is getting bored in class, teach differently or get them in a different class. They might just be too advanced for this. They might already know it. They might, it's just not, you know, where they, sh like for me, when people are like, God, you're so restless and you can't like sit through a movie. I'm like, I will walk out of a movie if 20 minutes in, I'm bored. And I was like, why can't you just sit through? Why would I? I'm leaving. Right. And people are like, you're so ADHD. It's like, no, I'll stay if it's great. Why do I have to, why do we pathologize people that, take an action or are able to have enough self-respect and respect for their time to abort something if it's boring to them. Yeah, boredom is the worst. I can't stand it. I, it's like my head's going to explode if I get bored. 
It's, 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 you know, for me, but that is like what dry, what is part of what makes you so successful. So people well, are like, and, why can't you sit in one place? This is the, the thing. Although it's stressful living life like that because you can never stop. That's why I want to never satisfied. That's right. Well, I never want to pathologize it because I'm like, if you're bored and restless in a meeting at your work, go start your own business because that's the kind of brain that is going to build. Like we need you. We don't need you in a cubicle. We need you to go start a business because you have a gifted brain. If you get bored easily, I think. Yeah. I think those are the people that change the world. Those people who are never satisfied and, and that they, they hate boredom. And then, however, when you're doing studies mm -hmm. and you have to read, does it ever get monotonous in a way to where you have to stick with something? Because... Oh. <laughs> Being you a scientist can be really boring. Like you can't just abandon a experiment because it was like getting boring and I have to watch this mi mouse run <laughs> around again. Well, the good thing about science is that uh, once you're through the, the early stages where you have to work through seven days a week, 24 hours, you're always on pretty much. But I'm not the one that has to stay up all night anymore. I just dream and I go and I think of new things and try and make new medicines and because if you're too bogged down stuff. in those logistics, you can't step back from the bird's eye view and have these big ideas. Right. And this is the problem that a scientist has to be able to do my minutiae. So I have to think at the nano scale level on atoms and chemicals, but also think about the planet. What does the planet need? And how do you take that and fix that? Mm -hmm. And that, that, if I was just doing experiments with test tubes all day, I couldn't do that. So I'm now free to do that, which is the best. But your kind of personality, did you have to actively allow yourself to delegate? Because I'm the kind of person that's like, I want to delegate, I, but I also have a little bit of guilt if I'm not doing it. But there's also a little bit of, uh, I, there's no way they did that right. I'm going to have to double check. Oh, uh, there's your problem. Mm -hmm. That's why you're stressed out. I'm really lazy. I don't like doing stuff. <laughs> Clearly. So I just find people that do those jobs better than me. Yes. And there's lots of jobs that people can do that are better than me. Writing grants, doing experiments, really anything, writing stuff. And I think that's the- I the, outsource it. The life hack for that is having the skill to hire well. And I finally have a team in my life that I can go, you edit all, I don't even need to look at it. But if you're micromanaging, it doesn't necessarily mean you have a personality flaw. It means you just have the wrong team. That's also. right. Also. Yeah, surround yourself with people that are better than you at, at whatever they do. Mm -hmm. That's the key. And I'm, I've hired some real, really useless people. <laughs> <laughs> Use them in experiment. But th that the other thing that Andre Agassi wrote in his book, which I admire, is he says, if somebody's a screw up, get rid of them yesterday. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite kind, so I, I, I struggle firing people. And I wish that I'd done that more. So that's my life lesson. Anyone who's listening, surround yourself with kind people. Mm -hmm. Uh, and get rid of the assholes. I have a no assholes policy in my whole life now. That's right. And also, asshole is subjective. Just because someone's hurting your feelings doesn't mean they're an asshole. You might be it overly does. sensitive, but I'm just saying you might be projecting like, because I think in my field, it requires so much, um, everyone's so emotional and sensitive in my field that if someone's like, yeah, do it this way, or just directness comes off as bitchy or asshole when it's actually just the nicest thing someone can be with me or anyone directing a movie, making a podcast is direct because that saves the okay. most time. I, I don't mind truthfulness. Yeah. That, that's what I look for. Yeah. It's the behind your back. Oh yeah, no, that's that's not okay. And I think that the way that I was able to get around how hard it was for me to fire people because I don't want to be a bad person is that when we are participate in a negative consequence for someone, then they get to grow and learn. We're giving them a gift. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I you keep mean, I saying guess, that. I guess if David Sinclair <laughs> fires you in your field, it ruins your life. But in my field, it, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Your whole thing is you need adversity to stay young. I'm keeping you young by firing you. <laughs> that is true. Go find someone else who, uh, you, who might like you. Yeah. <laughs> but you have to have such a zero tolerance policy because of how high stakes what you do is. Like, do you ever go, I can't believe I'm like in driving the the sort of vehicle that is leading humanity in a certain direction? Doesn't it feel like some pressure sometimes? Um, no, I'm enjoying myself a lot. It does get frustrating when it, when somebody's useless at doing stuff. Yeah. Um, and my lab is a bit like a kindergarten. I bring in young kids in their early 20s, mm -hmm. uh, and some of them are just untrainable. But most of them, because I'm at Harvard, we get really smart kids. And it's a joy to see them. Most of them are smarter than me, probably all of them actually. Um, and so they can do programming, they can do this and that. And I just say, here's the problem that I want fixed. 
you three go solve that. Mm. And it's just an amazing thing. Because also the more freedom you give someone, the more creative they're going to be and invested. Yeah. So my, my advice to anybody, especially scientists, is don't, don't worry about today's technology. Often people think, oh, we can do this, so let's just use that technology to solve that. Forget that. Just come to me with a good question and let's solve it. And make, if we have to invent new technology, we'll do that. But it's the question you want to start with. Are there any um, ideas you've had for experiments and studies that you were like, ah, like that, like there's jokes that I have that I'm like, I've worked on, I've tried. It's like, mm, it's just not the time or I haven't cracked it or it's not. Is there anything that's like your white whale of I would just need more money or I would need more time or I'd have to give all my time to it? Like, is there... There's thousands of that things that one I that got do. away. Yeah, because yeah, you have to make choice, Sophie's choice, in terms of your time. Sometimes. Yeah, it's true. And studying aging is you can't do the experiment overnight. Even to look at a mouse's lifespan takes two and a half, three years, and you can only do that a certain amount of times in your career. There, there is no one's ever asked me that. This is really good. <laughs> uh, there, there is one theory that I never got around to finishing testing, slash proving, hopefully, and it's called xenohormesis. Terrible name. Mm -hmm. Xeno means between species, and hormesis I mentioned, which is what doesn't kill you makes you live longer. Right. The idea is that if you stress plants and eat them, you get the benefits of the molecules that they're producing to survive. And can I ask you a question about how to stress a plant besides let it live with me, but how yeah. do you stress out a plant? <laughs> it's easy. Uh, people who make it? red wine Yellow do that all the time. Oh. Don't water it. Uh, put Got it in it. bright light. Let caterpillars eat it. Uh, fungus you know the problem with the food that we get at the regular supermarket is that it's in perfect conditions it grows quickly mm -hmm. but it's not full of those xenohermetic molecules that i think give us this pseudo long pseudo adversity and then the whole vegetable thing let's discuss because obviously you know your thing is eat the stressed out plant so that you don't have to stress you're going to get the benefits of eating the stress out plant is the way that we prepare food procure food at all uh, uh, vegetables at all undoing any of those benefits so it's like you know there's i get paranoid sometimes where i'm like ah, but all these fertilizers are on it and 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 is eating this i'm i'm eating a stressed out plant and that's supposed to be good for me but it's covered in chemicals like is this is this just the vehicle now that i'm putting antibiotics in my body because they spray it with fertilizers and crab and then when you cook it you cook all the vitamins out of it what's the point of even eating this yeah well that's the problem with agriculture today they want them to grow fast so they they put all these chemicals on them make sure there's not no chewing like you want it to be perfect there's no caterpillar marks on them but these are these are very happy plants you don't want to eat happy plants do we need to be worried about gmos the way no a lot of people no. do i don't I've care about you hate say mail. this hate mail Come at me. There's nothing oh, worry, wrong with GM, GMO. G what did I say? You said GMO. Oh. Uh, so the those who are against GMO, there's no evidence that GMO is bad for you. In fact, there are tens of millions of people who die, particularly kids, every year. People go blind from a lack of vitamin A across the planet. And there are plants that produce vitamin A genetically mm -hmm. that are banned by countries. And Europe just banned GMO even Recently, CRISPR, you know, the gene editing yeah. was banned in Europe. The reason that was political, that was not based on science. The French particularly wanted to protect their farmers from US imports. Uh, okay. So I, I've seen no evidence, and I'm a scientist, that GMO is bad. I mean, it feels bad. It sounds, it sounds like it bad. would be bad. It's, we've been changing the genetics of plants for the last 10,000 years at least. Mm -hmm. You you think that tomatoes are that big and blueberries are that big in the wild? No, we and corn is this big normally. We've been mu mutating these plants for for thousands of years, and we're not scared of those plants. Mm -hmm. But if we go in and change one gene very accurately, mm -hmm. then suddenly it's GMO. We can't eat it. We can't save kids' lives or you know their their eyesight. That's ridiculous. It is interesting, and it makes me think of how you know, we sabotage ourselves with our own emotions and imaginations of like, well, I read it on the internet so much to be true. How, you know, this sort of access to information for the first time, people have access to you. People can listen to, can talk to you and listen to you on podcasts for talk for three hours. Like, you know, this is an unprecedented level of access to accurate information now, but there's also an unprecedented ac access to information that is not true and people's like emotional need to sort of believe things that sound right to them with absolutely no degree in any of this. 
w is that something we're programmed to do? Because it's so bad for us. Like, why? I'm just obsessed mm -hmm. with our instincts that well, hurt us, our yeah. anti-survival instincts. Yeah, you've hit upon a few really good points. One is that we scientists never used to be able to speak to the public much. We used to go on NPR and that'd be it. Uh, and then everything I used to say in the 2000s to reporters in newspapers, it was never accurate. Stupid right. headline, Harvard professor says we're going to live forever. It would drive me nuts. Yeah, I barely they, speak to that's reporters how they, say, they stay in business by... Yeah morphing what you say into something that is like shocking and but at the I, expense of our credibility. Yeah, it, it was really bad. And then the public thinks, oh, Sinclair's cured aging, which was ridiculous. But then- The as, irony is that Upton Sinclair, perhaps a, a distant relative, sort of was the first muckraker, right, who would go in in the 20s. Uh, definitely not a relative. Okay. My name's made up. <laughs> you're speechless. For the first time, you're speechless. What do you mean? What did you did you did you make up a fake one? My father made up a fake one. Obsessed. Do you know what it was before? Of course. Was it something horrible like Cummings? So you had to change it. <laughs> no, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating to me. It was Zigati, which is a Hungarian name, which means little island. And he went to Australia in the fifties, and he was called a foreigner, a wog. We they mm -hmm. get called. So Sinclair, my my his mother, my grandmother was married to Mr. Lewis. Mm -hmm. So Sinclair Lewis sounded good. We, it does. It, Authoritative an, an author, has yeah. the word sin in it. Yeah. A little wink wink to your ancestry. So yeah, I'm not related to any Sinclairs, but oh. uh yeah, it's not a bad name. Mm -hmm. I like it. It's very um there's something really fascinating to me about how many judgments we make, even if we don't admit it to ourselves, based on someone's name. And it's so, it really makes me realize my internalized misogyny. If I'm about to have a big meeting with a lawyer named Tiffany, I'm like, Ugh. what is that? That's so unfair. This is why I'm worried about the Neuralink. I don't want anyone to hear my thoughts or see what I'm thinking right. because my first thought is always sexist, offensive. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, what we say in 12-step programs is you're responsible um, for your first action, but not your first thought. Because your first thought is old. It's based out of fear. It's your something you inherited. It's your dad's point of view, your grandmother's point of view. It's something toxic and wrong, fear-based, judgmental, critical. It's like our Lord of the Flies instinct. Yeah. And then we go, like, I, it happens to me. I'm going to say it. This is gross to say, but we have to start talking and admitting this. If Neuralink is going to come along and everyone's just going to be able to read everything that we think, we're going to have to play defense on this or get some protocols in place to be a little more forgiving with people's inner monologues. Because when I see a female pilot walk on the plane, I'm like, ooh. First thought, what? first Especially thought. Especially if it's a Tiffany. For <laughs> Pilot <laughs> Tiffany here, Tiffany Sinclair, <laughs> loading up to go to Boston. You'd be like, oh, you know what? I think I'm going to step off this flight. But then I go, no, 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 no. That's my primordial reptilian brain having an irrational reaction. But then I go, no, no, no. She's a pilot. She's a woman in a male dominated field. She probably had to work twice as hard to get half as far. She's probably better than the men. It takes me a second. You are such a sexist. That's I, terrible. Totally. I'm totally have internalized misogyny that comes from, I'm going to blame every movie I've ever seen and every magazine I've ever read. It's not conscious. It's just sort of like what I, the blueprint and I have to actively coach myself out yeah. of it. Yeah. Same thing with guys. When I see like a, you know, a guy go on stage to stand up, I'm like, here we go. Here are going to be the, like my wife, such a nag joke. And I'm like, what do you mean? Maybe he's going to go on and talk about how his heart is broken and he's suffering from depression. Like I, these stereotypes we have in our heads that are supposed to protect us and right. keep things simple are actually yeah. sabotaging us. It really is. I mean, it just makes life simpler if you can just judge someone without even bothering to get to know them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's a problem. Right. Because nobody's really who you think they are. Are you going to do Neuralink? Brains like yours can't just broadcast their thoughts to people. Uh, no, it would be scary if you knew what was going on in there. I know, but someone like you, like Neuralink technology, which is going to be able to project people's thoughts, that will happen in our lifetime, right? Or read people's thoughts. Not really. Not gonna happen. I don't. I don't. I, I'm not on the same page. They as don't Elon. call me Ho Rogan for no reason. 
I like to talk about Neuralink and how it's weeks away. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll it'll help with diseases like Parkinson's, whatever. But downloading a brain, not in our lifetime, I'm afraid. But someone like you, is your brain insured? Like, you know, J-Lo's butt is insured. <laughs> There's guitarists whose hands are insured. Uh, I am insured. That is for sure. There's key man insurance in a bunch of companies. So I guess you call that. Fascinating. Yeah. And then also when it comes to the longevity, and there's there's a couple things I want to get to that are sort of in a different space, but when it comes to longevity, is this going to be, I think about evolution a lot. I'm obsessed with it, even though I probably can't articulate anything, any ideas I have about it or sort of instincts, but be, these next, so let's say resveratrol, uh, uh, NMN, um, NAD, let's say you have to be somewhat privileged to have access to these, at least let's say financially, if you're going to spend say $300 a month on the pills and, um, uh, let's say healthy food is going to be a little more expensive. Although mm -hmm. if you're fasting, you're probably going to buy less of it. So maybe it's not, um, uh, <laughs> it is cheaper to fast, yeah. you know, cheaper to fast, uh, life hack. We can safely kind of say you have you have to have access to podcasts, access to a phone in order an internet to be able to listen to these podcasts to even ascertain this correct information. Is this the new Darwinism in a way going to be financial because of what people do and don't have access to and how they're going to be able to? Yeah, pro it's already like that, mm -hmm. right? Not everybody listens to your podcast. Um, what? Not every. Oh, there are a few wow. people I've met. <laughs> Call them. <laughs> My heart rate just goes to two hundred and fifty a minute. Who's going to have access yeah. to this? So when you talk about being able to cut a finger off and regenerate the finger, right. who's going to have access to this type of technology first? And is that going to radically is it going to cause riots? What's going to happen? Well, th this has been happening for the last few hundred years. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe longer, but you know, hundred years ago, the rich were flying. Of course. Uh, and they had access to all sorts. This is what happens with technology, but it eventually becomes democratized. Mm -hmm. um, I once said everyone can fly, and then I got apparently you know, there are a lot of people who can't fly, but it's a lot cheaper than it used to be. Put it that way. Oh, fly on airplanes, you mean? Well, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> you can I'm try. Like, uh, I missed the study <laughs> um, where there's a will, there's a way. I was like, maybe I just missed that. Really? We, we've put wings on. I'm like, I wouldn't be surprised. Like you're hanging out with Laird Hamilton. He puts like, you know, he can make surfboards fly through the water. I mean, who knows what's going on up there? So, so I'm trying to democratize everything. I'm trying to make these bio buttons uh, on our chest really cheap, mm -hmm. drugs cheap. Uh, the tests that tell you how old you are make that really cheap mm -hmm. so that everybody can have these technologies, not just for the wealthy few. But right now, there, there are a fair number of wealthy few who really are taking care of their bodies and I think are going to live a lot longer than the rest of us. Do you think there will be a day where, you know, and I know people get all paranoid about this and this is not me going down like a QAnon rabbit hole in terms of like the vaccine injects a chip in you. That's our, it, Will there be a day where when you apply for a job, you have to sort of sort of be fully transparent about the vitamins you take, about how you're taking care of, like, you know, so it's like if I'm making a decision between a 25 year old and a 40 year old, and that 40 year old can make a case to me that's like, I'm, I'm more valuable than a 25 year old because this mm -hmm. is, I'm actually younger biologically than that person. Yeah, but that, that works to your advantage if you've taken care of your body. So you can be 65, 70 and show up and say, I'm actually 40, hire me. Right, right. That'd exactly. be great. Yeah, like I mean, that's fascinating to me because because there's this clash right now of like I can't hire an older person because they don't know Dropbox and technology and Instagram, but a younger person is like entitled and sensitive and is going to cancel me for saying, you know, a word. There's just like a, I feel like there's going to be an interesting middle ground that's going to have more sort of justice and merit in the future when it's like, yeah, I'm 40, but I'm might as well be 25. Well, you can prove that you're 25 biologically with these tests that we're working on. So that there's going to come a day, I think, where in the next few years, you'll know your biological age for not a lot of money. Will you put that on your dating app or your real age? Well. <laughs> My biological age is 25. <laughs> I'm 50. But <laughs> we can even tell you how old your ovaries are. Well, oh, on no. That. Well, I got those x-rays. I wore the apron. <laughs> There's a lot of, of uh, uh, I've been hearing you talk about sort of fertility and the advancements in fertility now when it comes to mm -hmm. genetics. Yeah. Well, I don't know about people, 
But I do know about about uh, horses and mice. We can reverse infertility in those animals, yeah. and we're not too different from those. Uh, so if it's true, what we see in the mice is that we could take a 65 year old woman and make her fertile again. Now I'm going to get criticized because we don't know that for a fact. Right. But I'm just saying, if it extrapolates, that's what we'll be living with. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're t- we're trying that. And it's interesting because. You know, when I think about, I'm obsessed with like the biological basis for things like my brain just needs to know why this was advantageous to the human and why they evolved in this direction. So it's like women evolved to stop being fertile later in life, I guess, because the life expectancy was so low and Mm -hmm. it wasn't necessary. But, you know, I would say back in the day, that's a scientific term, uh, thousands of years ago, it would have been more advantageous to give birth young because you would be healthier. You'd be able to defend your child in a more robust way. You may be, so many women died on childbirth. Maybe your chances of surviving were higher. But my brain goes, the older you are, the better a mother you're going to be because you're going to know more. You're going to be more patient. You're going to select mm-hmm. a more qualified partner. Like, 65 is probably when you should start having kids, frankly. That's Absolutely. What, that's when people finally figure their shit out. <laughs> right. And that's when you have the least amount of time. It's true. I I totally agree. Don't get married till 65. That's a that's a really good idea. <laughs> as long as I don't look 65, I feel like I'll be fine. Uh, well, so humans and even mice, female mice, lose their fertility about halfway through their lifespan. Mm-hmm. Um, so this idea that women stop giving birth because it's dangerous, I don't think that's true because mice also do. And, and mice- don't die from having little pups. But what I think is is going on is that the reproductive system is just fragile. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are other parts of our bodies that continue on way beyond where we should be. Mm-hmm. I mean, the reason we age actually is that we just were not selected to live beyond about 45 because we were probably going to die from a war or famine mm-hmm. or whatever. Uh, and we're just at the whim of entropy now. We just fall apart after age 45. But there are plenty of species that live a lot longer than that for thousands of years. So we just need to re-engineer ourselves. It's a big part of your job as you're, you know, developing all these technologies to combat aging, you know, is the speed at which dangerous, you know, technologies and uh, pollutants because of climate change and how toxic air is getting and how toxic, you know, EMFs are or, you know, can I say free radicals? I don't even know where that's that a real thing coming through. Yep. Um, it's almost like your technology has to be twice as good to keep up with how toxic things are getting. It's almost like it almost just cancels out how dangerous the world is getting. How can you ever get ahead of how quickly our environment is becoming more and more unhealthy uh i'm i'm almost speechless because that's the topic of the book that i'm writing oh uh we're on this treadmill written by david Sinclair and when you come in we haven't talked about this right uh, just, no. oh, okay well don't write a book about I, that. <laughs> i'm just fascinated by the treadmill you have to chase yes. in terms of in 20 years will all your anti-aging advancements just take us back to the age we should be and cancel everything out, you know yeah we have to keep engineering our way out of the problems we've had ever since we picked up a stick as a tool. Because I'm Going thinking about you and ago. I'm thinking about, I've read so much about how, you know, conscious you are of the, you know, environment and such, because it's like none of your stuff is going to work if the environment gets more and more yeah. unhealthy and food gets more and more toxic. Exactly. Right. But we have to fix both. We have to fix our, our lifestyle, our environment, and our bodies that we inherited from our ancestors who didn't care if we lived beyond 50. Can I ask you about fear and inherited fear and you know, in terms of, you know, family constellation is not a science, obviously. It's, it's, you probably never even heard of it. It wouldn't even get to you. It's sort of the idea that we have inherited guilt and shame from our ancestors, whether, you know, it's, it's just what we grew up in, whether it's, you know, I, I, you really changed my life because hearing a, uh, someone as renowned and brilliant as you say that we are not, essentially in cages uh, sort of built by what we've inherited and our DNA. Mm -hmm. I'm always told in addiction programs that genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. So in my head, it's always been kind of 50-50. And I've had a lot of reservations about having kids because I'm like, I don't want to pass on the mental illness. I don't want to pass on the addiction. Like, is it inhumane for me to even procreate given how I'm going to load this kid up with sort of, Mm -hmm. you know, a bad deck of cards and, and hearing you say like, you know, I think it was 20, you're like 20% of your life is kind of ordained by your genetics. And I went, Oh, okay. Then I think I'll have kids. 
then the, the it's not my fault. Do if it. The kids a fuck up. It's only twenty percent my fault. <laughs> right. You know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You inspired me it, that because I think that so many of us feel like we are imprisoned by the bad choices of our ancestors and the bad habits that we inherited, and we feel like hopeless. Like this is just my blueprint, and I'm just I'm turning it to my mom. There it is, and we have no real control you know, over our destiny because of what we have inherited. That said, you know, I'm obsessed with these two studies that you're going to probably uh, T-bunk right now or tell me I've got them wrong uh -huh. about um, there were mice that were electrocuted every time they smelled a cherry blossom and then their offspring when they smelled a cherry blossom would recoil. So they inherited this sort of fear mm -hmm. to keep themselves safe just in one generation of mice and then how babies like will sort of uh recoil at a picture of a spider even they don't really know what a spider is how we inherit these fears mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how does that imprint onto our dna well it it sounds feasible i don't know about that particular study but mm -hmm. Well, I did it. I, I brought a bunch of babies into my house and I just threw just, spiders at them. It, they seem terrified. You're just making this up as you go yeah. along. <laughs> I'm a rogue scientist. <laughs> but it is true. And we've done this in my lab. We've published this, that if you have, if you take a mouse and make it fat, then the kids that are born are going to be predisposed to type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. So that there's this whole other layer of inheritance. But is it because they're, they're watching their parents be obese? No, not at all. It's in the womb. The way the genes are expressed, turned on and off, mm -hmm. is dictated by how the mum behaved. Mm -hmm. So you can have a big influence on your baby. Is the biological basis of that, your mom was in an environment, or dad, whatever, where being obese was auspicious and beneficial. Therefore, you're probably going to grow up in the same environment as them. This will be beneficial to you, which is why we're passing this on. Yes. Right. That's exactly right. Because genes don't change much. But mm -hmm. the what we call the epigenome, I'm sure you know this, but not everyone does. We got the genes, the genome, and the epigenome. Epigenome is the the reader of the genes, mm -hmm. the control system. Um, and so I guess that this is the the basic instructions, and then this is the reader of that. But you're gonna let me finish? I'm not gonna interrupt <laughs> David Sinclair. Are you insane? Not that crazy. Because I'll lose my train of thought because no, I have no, go, ADHD. Go. So let me Okay, so the 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 idea is that the epigenome is affected by the environment. And our health in the future, as well as our health as a baby, is largely epigenetic. So your genes are not your destiny. The, the, the geneticists ruled the 20th century, but the epigeneticists are ruling the 21st century. Mm. And how consciously do you have to act to unprogram the instincts or, or um, epigenetics of your ancestors, even your own parent, in order to stop the um, sort of like marionette operator that drives you with those inherited fears mm. and that w that are designed to keep you safe. It's just that our genetics don't know that, you know, like I know people that are like deathly afraid of heights. Mm -hmm. I think everyone should kind of be afraid of heights, but <laughs> there's some people or people that are just like, uh, uh, I know someone that's really scared of like salad and green vegetables or really scared of certain things. And it's like, well, maybe you had an ancestor that like ate putrefied lettuce and got septic or, you know, who knows? Like maybe there's something to these irrational fears. Maybe these are actually superpowers and your body is so psychic and is, we are so wired to have our bodies remember what hurt or killed our ancestors. For sure. That it drives us. Yeah, how yeah. There's science behind that. That That's how the epigenome works. Mm -hmm. We have, can I get a little scientific here? Please. Okay. So the DNA is just a chemical string with four letters, A, C, T, G. That's just a piece of chemical it's mm -hmm. it's it's inert but what controls it in the cell are chemicals that get added onto that dna there's one called a methyl which we can read and that's how we determine your biological age we map those changes over time but those methyls are actually controlling whether that gene for a salad phobia is on or off right and so your genes aren't always on your environment determines in some part whether it's turned on or off does being pregnant turn them on or off like, you know, when women, they get pregnant, all of a sudden they're, like, they're super scared of eggs. And you're like, what? Or they're super well, into of pickles. Yes. Yes. Your your body is changing the way your genes are turned on and off every second. Right now, as you listen to me, your genes are t being turned on and off in your brain and permanently changed. This is happening all the time. And, and the longer we do the good things in life, the better we are at having a healthy genome, epigenome and genome. And we can read that.
I know that I'm asking a scientist a question that can never be proven, but can our irrational fears today mm -hmm. tell us anything about the trauma or peril of our ancestors? Yes. Why do you think we're afraid of snakes and spiders? That's humanity. That's in innate. Why do you think we love sitting around a fire? Because mm -hmm. tribes that hated fire are all extinct. Right. So, yeah, what we love and what we hate comes from our distant past. And then what's the difference between that and like allergies? Nothing. Nothing. I, so, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> but I'm saying are allergies designed to keep us safe or are they just oh, a maladaptive thing? Yeah, that's maladaptive. Okay. Yeah. I mean, th there's a good reason to have mast cells go crazy when there's something foreign in your body. Right, right. You, you've got to keep foreign out, but the allergies is just overreacting. Right. Right. Pollen's not going to kill you. And is that someone who is um, ill? Is that our? Is that the version? Uh, are are people that have allergies? Is someone that has a bunch of them? Are these the people that are you know uh, um, equivalent to the giraffes that weren't evolved to eat the lettuce? Lettuce, the lettuce in the trees, <laughs> the salad trees in Africa. The <laughs> <laughs> you know, the cabbage uh, Christmas trees they make. Uh, like, uh, I'm just picturing a giraffe eating eating arugula. <laughs> but the, whatever those trees are called, um, that are their necks evolved, okay. obviously, to be high enough to reach them. Right. The ones that couldn't reach it. Are those, like, people with allergies today? Are we people that are... That would have died out? Yeah. If it's bad enough, yeah. And a lot of us that should have died out 100 years ago are alive just by the skin of our that, teeth. Well... All of us should be dead. None yeah. of us are equipped to survive in the world anymore. It's our tools that have allowed us to survive. Do you think that's part of we why we have wimpy. this, like, you don't seem to have it because you have such a control over your destiny? It's It, it seems like like a, you have a strong understanding of what's going to keep you safe in the future and keep you healthy, where a lot of us are like, is it this? Is it this? Should I drink Diet Coke? Should I not? Should I drink wine? Should I not? Some people say it's bad. Some people don't. Avocados are bad now. Like, what, this water's poison. Like, we don't have the facts, so yeah. we're just constantly perseverating and worrying and assuming we're being lied to and whatever. And um, my question is like, um, hold on, I'm going to get to it. Hold on. I looked at you and then I thought about you losing your train of thought. And I was like, don't lose your train of thought. <laughs> and here I am. I just manifested it. Um, is there something to be said for, there's this war on anxiety right now. Everyone's obsessed with, I have anxiety. I know a lot of people that have legitimate anxiety disorders. They can't leave their bed. They can't function. They can't go to work. I'm not a doctor. I can't diagnose if there's something else going on there. I don't know. But I, I think that because having anxiety served us so well in the past in terms of we got to get out of here. This isn't we should plan for the future. We should keep right. some of this food instead of eat it all right now. What anxiety helped us. And now there's an anxiety that's obsolete, just a, a, a uh, low grade anxiety. I think we all kind of have. And I always wonder if some of that has to do with the fact that we're only superficially at the top of the food chain. It's like most animals could probably kill us if they wanted to. We can oh, die sure. from a bee. A bee can kill us. A tiny thing this well, big can kill us. We are pathetic. As we a are trash bags full of blood. We are a lollipop with a body that's a stick and a giant head. That's all we are. We we know on some level that we are so incredibly vulnerable. Yeah. Well, it, you go in any chimpanzee could knock your head off. Even a, even you meet a Neanderthal, they'd kill us with one punch. We are pathetic, but we but our tools allow us to survive. Right, and our opposable thumbs and our tools. So it's like we have this superficial dominance over apex predators because we drug them and we shoot darts at them and we put them in cages. But the second mm -hmm. that cage unlocks, you're like, oh, yeah. Right. I remember I had my ear bitten off by a dog. It, it, it's back on. They sewed it back on. But the ease with which it snapped off, it wasn't, the dog wasn't even trying to attack me. It was just like a little bite, like a play bite. Yeah. And my entire ear was hanging off. It happened so quickly. And when you sort of see a part of your body be able to be removed that quick, you're just like, we are not durable at all. Right. Uh, so there's one, I think there's a, a Pixar movie or Disney movie that the ant looks at the human. Is it when the, the boy becomes small in, in the ant world? Oh, look, mommy, his guts are on the outside. That's what we are. We're pathetic. We've got all this soft Ooh. stuff that you could just rip off. Plus, we've got no muscles. This is pathetic, you know. Look at three years at the gym. doesn't really do much to us. Yeah, but when I look at people that are like overly muscular, I'm like, you're not reading. 
<laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's also not great either. When you see someone who's like super muscular and you're like, you have no love in your life. Like you're insecure. There's a psychological issue for, you know what I mean? That's a whole other addiction. I feel like this is what humans should look like. Thank you. We're not going to war. No one's drafting you. When I look at these men in their 40s and 50s that like need to like, I'm just like, what is, no one's drafting you. No one's calling you. Like the Patriots are never going to call you in. Why are you spending your life at the gym? This is not a good use of your time or energy. Uh, no one needs you to be an Adonis at this age. You can well, be, you you run 10 miles great, but you don't have to look like a cartoon character. You've just, again, offended a fair number of people, I including love you guys. our friends. No, I think this is important to know because the men listening, I always like to say there's a, there is a lot of sexism against men, which is like women are always trying to be smaller and smaller and thinner and thinner. And men are always trying to be bigger and bigger and bigger. And they live with anxieties and fear every day. I'm too skinny. You know, the hairline thing like men have these very real insecurities and theirs are ones that actually you just looked at my hair. You can't really change. I know because you have an incredible hairline. And I remember Joe Rogan mentioning that you have no gray hairs and you still don't. We'll talk about it. But um, I think there's something fascinating about, because we don't talk about male insecurities and male fears. And men's, I believe, for correct me if I'm wrong, are height, if you're too short, hairline, right? And dick size. Three things you cannot change. Women, if your insecurities are weight, your skin, your lip, those are all changed. We can change those. Men's are not able to be changed. Maybe they're being changed in your lab right now. But Yeah, we're working on dick size right now. <laughs> because... The things that men grapple with with insecurity, you can't just go to a plastic surgeon. You can't take a vitamin. You can't, you know, put a hat on. You can't put hair extensions in the way we, you know what I mean? You can't put the mm -hmm. fake nails on. We have this pass where we can kind of put pieces of plastic on us and no one thinks it's weird. Like plastic, thi we can put other people's hair in our head and people are just <laughs> fine with it. People think it's pretty. Can you imagine? And then when guys put a toupee on, we're like, oh, toupee much? Whereas I'm walking around with some Russian prostitute's hair in my <laughs> head at all times. Like, you're like, oh, it's so hard for women. Yeah, totally. But it is socially acceptable for us to basically wear cock and grout on our face to be able to sort of hoodwink someone into thinking we look. We can put fake eyelashes on. We can just put spider legs on our eyelashes and no one thinks it's weird. <laughs> well, that's our ancestors' fault. You know, we, we are descended from people who, women who prettied up and men who were muscular. Mm-hmm. But we're still pathetic as a species, no question. But it's good to maintain some muscle mass. Yes. I'm not doing this because I want to look good. Um, it doesn't hurt, but right. I'm doing it because as I get older, I'm losing muscle. I'm 51, almost 52. I'm losing about a percent of my muscle every year, and I don't want to. Um, it's not good for my health. Mm -hmm. It's not good for my testosterone levels, which are helpful in some ways. Mm -hmm. But also what the biggest problem for the elderly is they fall over and break their hips. So I exercise uh, to keep those muscles strong too. So people forget it's not just about eating less often. It's you got to do the opposite, which is bulk up as well a bit. I know you're not a big fan of meat because of the cholesterol and high protein. My question: I have two questions in this area. Number one: Do you ever eat bone marrow? Um, I'm not opposed to it. Do, mm -hmm. you, do you have some? Well, I do. <laughs> I know I was going to extract some of yours today for my collection. <laughs> um, no, because I, I was reading about how part of the reason humans were able to grow their brains so quickly and evolve is because they were not able to capture... Um, you know, animals, uh, they had to basically eat what was left over that that apex predators killed, right? Whether it was like an ox or a moose or whatever. And all that was really left was the the bone marrow. And, and actually, that's the least trash part of the meat. Right. That's where all so that's how the brains grew so much. So actually not being able to catch the moose where you would just kind of eat the meat, they had to settle for the crappy bone marrow, which by some twist of irony was the most nutritious part. Yeah, there's some truth to that. I, I agree. Also, cooking fire was very helpful because mm. unlike what we t tend to think, actually cooking animals is very good for getting the nutrients out. It's very hard to eat muscle unless it's cooked. And let me ask you, is, is part of the reason just as a expert in genetics and is the reason that meat is not particularly good for us is because we were never able to really capture it until quite recently and haven't had a chance to evolve for it to be healthy for us or to wow you've asked a question that no one has in my circles all right so thinking on on my feet here mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think you're right. Carnivores don't have a short lifespan because they eat meat. Uh, I think the reason probably is that we we haven't been carnivores for that long. But there are other reasons. There are chemical reasons why why meat's not that good. Mm. There are certain amino acids that turn off our body's defenses. They turn them off. So leucine, isoleucine, and valine, these are called branch chain amino acids. When we eat a lot of those, there's a defense system called mTOR mm -hmm. uh, that you want to be on. And in fact, if you if you make this defense uh, get switched on in a, a mouse, it'll it can live 20, 30 percent longer. So by eating a lot of these amino acids, which is particularly in meat, you're not allowing your body to turn on defenses as much as it normally would. But by eating mostly plants, which is what I do, I, I, I will eat meat, mm -hmm. um, just not excessively. Yeah. You get the benefits, these xenohermetic molecules from, from your salad, yeah. plus you're not turning off your body's defenses with excess amino acids from meat. Right. And then because if we were designed to eat meat at every meal, wouldn't our intestines be a little bit shorter? Because doesn't the meat tend to putrefy by the time it gets through our longish intestine? Oh, we have really short intestines, actually, mm. for, for a mammal and certainly for a primate. It's shrunk because we were able to cook our food and get the nutrients out. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And the other argument is about how we have such sharp incisors. But plants are hard to eat, too. You need sharp teeth to eat a jicama. What's a jicama? <laughs> It's like a little a jicama. It's a thing that you put in salad. Like, you know what a watercress is? Those little sure. yummy things. G-I-C-I. A jicama. They have these in Australia. I, I had a jicama on my neck the other day. <laughs> <laughs> um, if it's from Gabby Reese, you better frame it. Jicama. It's like a, it's like a legume, I think. That's kind of cr crunchy and watery. Oh, you mean a legume? A le legume, yes. Mm. And I think that it's not green, so you probably have deleted it from your memory. It has no use for you. Because you don't like starchy white vegetables. I try to avoid starch because it's basically strings of sugar. Right. But is in, And you have said that basically the more like exotic or, you know, basically the prettiest colored things are the most stressed out. Usually, yeah. Yeah. That's like a, a good shortcut. Yeah, go for it. Eat colored things. Yeah. Right. Watery white things, not so good. Because that's usually just like more sugar and more starch. This is a really crazy question. Stay with me. Uh, <laughs> so we know in, in these, these controlled environments in your lab, first, can I ask just about the overthinker that I am? Is it called the Heisenberg effect where what you're measuring with affects the outcome is right. that still the uncertainty principle right is that still true and do you account for that in physics it is uh yeah actually one of the reasons i think we'll never be able to fully download the brain is that very thing that the act of measuring it will change it unfortunately because you know it's being measured and you're thinking or something i'm thinking more physical of slicing through the brain and measuring every molecule is going to change stuff anyway Oh, fascinating uh, but yeah, wh why do you ask that? Because I'm just I'm just fascinated in in sort of your process and 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 I I your research is correct. Like there's a lot of like gut checks of when like I hear something you're like that just doesn't sound right. You know, even though I'm not a scientist, you know. And I was going to ask you about things that you feel a hunch about that you can't prove right now. And I'm just fascinated in what those are because chances are you're right if you can't prove it. Horses that um you know, famously won't go under a bridge and they'll whip it and they'll try to get it under a bridge and the bridge will collapse two days later. And there's no way to really explain how it knew. Yeah. They do have nerve cells. They are, you can't really quantify or prove something that's that nebulous and- Are you saying, is there something I'm not scientific about? Intangible. No, I was gonna ask, is there anything, and then I wanna get to the mouse thing, but is there anything that you have a hunch that's true, but it would take 30 years to prove or would take $10 billion to prove. We're like, I just, I know this is true just in my cells. Does that make sense? Uh, right, how deep do you wanna go? Like for example, like, you know, there's this amazing book that I love and I give to all the women in my life um, by Gavin De Becker, who's a really famous security person. I'm sure you know him in, in Los Angeles. Um, and he has a book called The Gift of Fear. Mm -hmm. And it's all about um, sort of how when women are in these horrible sexual assault situations by strangers, basically a hundred percent of them, the percent that doesn't do this is probably just too traumatized or they weren't really able to interview them properly, say, I knew there was something off about that guy. 
Yes. He carried my groceries. He opened the door for me. He was super nice. He was well dressed. He had a good job, but I knew there was something off. They can't prove mm -hmm. why. There's times I'll have people come to my shows and there'll be people that are in like big biker costumes with chain wallets and security's like, are you worried about that? I'm like, no, not in the slightest. But then there's someone that seems non-threatening or even a woman and you're like, I have a bad feeling and I can't. Right. And dogs do this all the time. They have this sense. Like things like that, that you can't okay. really prove. Yeah. All right. So yes. there's a bunch, there's a bunch of things. Um, I believe that we have a backup copy of youth in all of our cells that can be accessed. I suspect that uh, there is such thing as serendipity, though I cannot prove it. And yes. And if you were going to even try to prove it, where, how would you even start? Because- well, you need to have multiple universes, and that's the problem. That's expensive. That sounds yeah, because you need a placebo universe. Because, and I always think about that because it's like you know when you you hear a word, someone says that shirt's diaphanous, and you're like, well, that's a big word I never hear. And then for some reason, the next book you read, it's in it. The next movie you watch, diaphanous is in it. And then someone's like, that shirt's diaphanous, and you're like, I haven't heard this word <laughs> in twenty years, and I've heard it three times in a day. Yeah. Did I did I always hear it? And I just never thought about it, and now I'm just looking for it. So I've manifested it. Like what? Th there's no way to ignore that coincidence, right? So it layered, I guess, under that is um, the issue of physics, where you have entanglement. That you know where I'm going. I think if you separate, do you know where I'm going? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you're going, but there are certain. Place I don't want you to go. <laughs> so there are two. You separate particles. Mm -hmm. You split them, mm. and then one's thousand miles away, and the other one's here. Mm -hmm. And we, if you look at that one, that one will change instantaneously. If that isn't crazy, then you're not thinking hard about it. That means there's something un underlying this whole world that we live in that we can't even comprehend. Mm. So I don't know if that's proof of serendipity, but I've just seen some crazy shit. In serendipity, what is that? Even, does that mean? something was so coincidental that it was planned by a greater force or that you manifested it or you wanted it so it occurred like right because we as humans by looking at you you are getting to the uncertainty principle so just by looking at stuff we change the universe that's crazy isn't it crazy does, does a dog change the universe when it looks at it can't prove it i don't know who knows what about a worm Worms are so cute. But see, <laughs> I'm obsessed with Labyrinth. The worm from Labyrinth is my favorite little animal on the planet. I have, I'll have. i show you in my attic. I have lots of little statues of her. And, and um, I have a, a lot of mugs with her on it, too. I'm very into the worm from Labyrinth. I think worms are important. They are. Um, I'm not going to disagree. They're, they're also very, very good for lifespan experiments. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, we make them live longer. Benton, we take a break to talk about how we're not only best friends, but... Best fiends. Are we best fiends? I feel like a fiend. <laughs> I feel like a little, like a little bug. <laughs> I'm obsessed with this Listen, game. Listen, I played this game. Oh, my flight was delayed on the way back from Nashville for like almost two hours. So I'm gonna, we're gonna watch your game for a second. Because yeah, this is my brain at work. Because if you see how cute this is and how fun this is to play, it's also challenging. By the way, you it's not simple as you look. It's a lot of work. You gotta, you gotta get this box down here. You gotta connect dots. You only have so many moves. I gotta fight this slug. That's scary. <laughs> and but, look at my little creatures, my little bugs. Those are your little bugs. So what are you, you're basically? You gotta match. So you get the little water molecules. You gotta get them together, and then that makes my little water bug shoot some. You know, at the at the at the slug. Mm -hmm. And then the strawberries are for the little scorpion dude. The leaves are for that little. What is he a tick? Um, Can it, I tell you something about this is so soothing to me. It truly is so fun. There's no other puzzle matching game like it. It is so fun. They're always updating it. Always something new. You're always winning prizes. I, literally almost every day there's like some new, it feels new. Download the five star rated puzzle game, Best Fiends, free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Beans. This podcast is sponsored by one of my favorite companies on the planet. It's called Brooklinen. Brooklinen. It's been a game changer. I used to struggle with sleep. I was insomniac. I was too hot. I was too cold. The sheets dried out my face. I didn't like it. I had to get a new pillowcase. Brooklinen, I sleep like a baby and not the kind that scream and pee in the middle of the night and don't sleep well. The ones that yeah, you give a baby a little, worth keeping. The one you give. <laughs> 
<laughs> the one you give a little Benadryl to, a little dime Hello, tap. Hello, whiskey baby. Don't do that. Don't give your baby whiskey. <laughs> you, I mean. Listen, this is Mrs. B. I'm having a slumber. My little leaf pillow in my Brooklyn, and I couldn't be more comfortable. That's concrete. So you can sleep outside in the concrete in Brooklyn. Oh, in the heat, still wrapped up. Look how happy I am. You are still snug as a bug uh, in a rug. What but else can you it. do? That's what else can it. you do with your Brooklyn Listen, and sheets? You know that I love the outside when I'm inside. So my Brooklyn and sheets, a fort. Everywhere <sighs> I go, I'm comfortably inside. Normally, when you make a fort with sheets, it blows away. It's not heavy enough. It doesn't protect you from your parents seeing you. This is the perfect fort sheet. Also, yeah, and it definitely isn't, isn't that cute. <laughs> Brooklyn, it makes it cute. Also, what's you know, it, sometimes I feel really trapped. But, oh. but, but, but with, with Brooklyn, uh -huh. I can escape any situation comfortably and safely. Oh, really? Yeah, look how That's easy that you. is. Okay. I'm shimmying right out the window. Oh, oh. my goodness. <laughs> and then, what listen, else? I can't always afford a 40-inch custom lace front wig. But what I can get is my Brooklyn and wrap myself up and I can turn some Luke's. Look how you just made yourself into a look fashion at me, Ms. icon. Miss Thing right there. And what is this? The, you know what? I can, uh, royal weddings, debutante balls, proms, Brooklyn and sheets work. They're better than gowns. This is you just dressed in Brooklyn and sheets. What's this? this? Oh, I'm on my way to get a snack. I gotta run, but I wanna be dramatic. <laughs> and th any, What's this? Right, the, the, You're dancing outside this with This is the any 90 music video by Brooklyn and sheets. I don't wanna wait for our lives to be over. Oh, this is that. Tell is me it's not that. I want people to understand that Brooklyn isn't just sheets, it's a moment. Moment. That's a quality sheet that ripples in the wind like that. Look how it just that ripples. That sheet made me ten times more elegant. Look at this. Look at the way that it 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 it, it um, shimmers in the sun because that is the high quality thread count. Everyone that saw me shocked, amazed. Look at me. I'm a superhero. <laughs> Oh, oh this? this is a flashback from when I died as an ex-wife. Oh, this looks this that yeah. is exactly what I, it yeah, is. Yeah, we're having a flashback. I'm so sorry. This is a montage of of, of a, a in an indie movie when they show the ex-wife in like a, a nightmare or a dream. That Look is, how fun you are. Me. Look how flirty you are under there. Oh, what's this? That's that's how it ended. Oh. You're going to be, you want to be buried in the Brooklyn is, is that why you're- I mean, they're that comfortable. I mean, it makes sense. Brooklyn and does all these other incredible things as Benton just illustrated with, with these videos. I am blown away. I am dazzled. I'm impressed and I'm humbled. Brooklyn and it was started to create beautiful, high quality home essentials. They work directly with manufacturers to make luxury available directly to you without these luxury level markups. Thank God you get their incredible array of products without having to overpay. It's at a reasonable price because no one should have to, it, it, sheets shouldn't be elitist. Everyone should be able to get a good night's sleep. Uh, they have these like buttery soft super breathable sheets they have the plush absorbent towels that is the only towels that can clean up the kind of messes i make cozy robes and also the the loungewear is so nice because a lot of loungewear you feel like it's loungewear and the knees get baggy and the elastic starts to pull and you're sort of like you know it makes you feel like a slob this is loungewear you could easily where to a stumble into a Starbucks, they'll be fine with it. Like it is quality, cozy loungewear. They're so confident in their core products. They'll come with a 365 day warranty. So give yourself the comfort refresh you deserve and get it for less at Brooklyn. And go to brooklinen.com and use promo code Whitney to get $20 off with a minimum purchase of $100. Dollars. That's Brooklyn and B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N dot com and enter promo code Whitney for $20 off with a minimum purchase of $100. That's Brooklyn and com promo code Whitney. So Benton, are you dressed as a ghost? You can see me? Yes, I can see you. <gasps> you have the gift. <laughs> <laughs> What's this video that just appeared magically on my computer that I didn't put there or know anything about? Let me see it. The ghost of Kate Hudson. <laughs> and almost famous. <laughs> Do you hear my ghost noises? Mm, I don't know if it's oh. me. Is that you dressed I, as a ghost? I, I can't. Um, could be, but. Because I'm actually, I've been being haunted by a very. Oh. I've, sheedy looking ghost lately. I've been haunting you for months. So I have, I, I, we were actually had called the security because there was footage on our security camera of a ghost. Mm, cameras can't see ghosts. Wait, is, hold on, will you pull up the, this is footage from my ring camera. Is this you? Uh, this is me haunting what you home at night. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that was a was ghost. Was that you? I said it was a ghost. 
Was that wasn't you saying you were a ghost? I think that was the ghost of Kate Hudson. Okay. This is the magic of Brooklyn and sheets. Dead or alive, they're comfortable. <laughs> Back to our podcast about longevity, which will postpone death. <laughs> Die early, stay young forever. <laughs> okay, so the mice. All, everything that you're proving in mice, horses with the you know reproductive nature. Is there anything that humans, because we're so messy and we're so um, diverse in terms of our trauma, our association to authority, or fear of not being liked. I remember when I I would um when I first uh came to Los Angeles, I didn't have any money and I would do these focus groups. I wrote about this in my book. I would do focus groups for like, you can sign up on this list and they are like, hey, do you want to take this pill for two weeks and tell us how you feel? I did that too. Really? I thought, getting 150 bucks, that's cool. The cash. Yeah. Yes. What I, but what I didn't know is you show up and it's mostly like meth addicts. They don't really <laughs> want to like improve the product. I was always the overachiever dork, like type A person who was like, yeah, I feel like I, you know, because there was one for Neutrogena and the product I don't think ever came out. It came out like short term and then i think there was like some weird lawsuit it was like a, an exfoliator and excuse me we had to use it for like a month and then come in and check in and talk about it and i was the person that was like you know i feel like the brush like it goes counterclockwise it should go clockwise like it should also chart and everyone was also like shut up like we're just trying to get the money to go like get our methadone you <laughs> asshole i was like really invested in making the product better i thought it was like, changing the world and um but i do know that when i would do some of these experiments i would very much tell people what i thought they wanted to hear mm -hmm. and i would go to therapists in my 20s and lie because i was just scared that I was humans are so complicated we're worried about disappointing people we're worried about being mm. embarrassed we're worried about um are humans what they say when you're going to be doing studies on humans will what they say ever be valid or does it only have to be what they're capable of and what their medical tests are well uh well I know a lot about medical tests I don't know so much about human humans lie tests. how do you study them <sighs> Even when they lie to themselves, they might not even know they're lying. They might think they're really healthy. They, they might come to you and go, hey, yeah, I don't smoke. So, so there's, a, there's a trick in psychology, which is you bring people in and you tell them this is what the experiment is, but it's not. So they get fooled and then they get gets revealed what they're really doing. Interesting. Yeah. So, so, cause if I came into your lab and wanted to be a part of a study on longevity and you were like, okay, tell us about your lifestyle and everything you do. I go, yeah, I'm really healthy. I only eat healthy in my head. That's what I've deluded myself into thinking. So I don't feel bad all the time. How can you tell the difference between someone's delusion of themselves or narcissism? Yeah, it's really true. Yeah. Yeah. And, and number of drinks per week. Yeah. I'm not a liar. I don't remember because I drank so much. I'm going to say two, but it was five, <laughs> but I only remember two. So what's true? You're talking before lunch? Or <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this this is a problem that we we have very bad, poor memories and we're fooled by by a whole bunch of things. And people want to impress you. You're David Sinclair. You probably can't even be in the room. Like your <laughs> presence. No, I, I, there's this famous story um, about... Uh, about Conan O'Brien, when he would go into the writer's room of a show that he was producing, they'd be like really creative. But when he came in, everyone would be really intimidated. They was here, people would stop pitching. And he was like, these writers suck. And I was like, no, no, no they're only like this when you're yeah. here because they're intimidated. Right. That happens in my lab too. So I, I try to leave them alone and they're much more creative. And then I just judge what, what they do later. But th this is a real issue that, that when you observe something, it changes. Mm -hmm. So you, you try to just put things aside and experiment, and we blind ourselves, right? Everyone knows about double blinds. So our experiments, whether they're on worms or mice or whatever, the people who are feeding the mice and giving the molecules to mice to make them live longer, we don't know really which mouse is getting which. And if we look at their organs, the microscopist who's looking at the organs doesn't know which is which. So that, because otherwise, you know, oh, wow, that one supposed to be young, kind of looks young. Yeah. To, so we can fool ourselves, it's really terrible. Um, so that's what we do as scientists. It's all about trying to make sure we don't fool ourselves. And it's really, really hard. It's what we are it's why we get a PhD. It's to learn how to not fool ourselves. Mm. And to hold yourself accountable and not get invested in an outcome and right. to go, I've been working on this for eight years, but if it's not, if the data doesn't say it, I'm not allowed to Yeah, you should see what happens to scientists. Interest in it. Yeah. Yeah. There there are times that there are paradigm shifts mm. in science. There's kicking and screaming when that happens because people's whole careers are built on this idea and then it's flipped and then then you're in trouble and then the, there's a war and then eventually those people die 
and you get you know the new reality. The study becomes about what happens to a scientist when they go crazy. <laughs> you, this is a study, just not the study you thought was happening. How right. quickly can a scientist get themselves fired by <laughs> being too invested in evidence? And I guess like I'm I'm fascinated by the the intangible things that keep us alive longer or less stressed out longer, hence alive longer, whether it's, you know, a lot of these places that, you know, there's always these articles of who lives the longest and what state, mm -hmm. what country, what place. It's usually like a little town in Greece or Sardinia where they boil it down to, okay, it's the Mediterranean diet. It's the ocean. They're looking at the horizon, Huberman 101, or they also are a small town where everyone knows each other, they have eye contact every day, they socialize, like the sort of intangible things. And when you look at like, okay, do I go work out for three hours or do I work out for two hours and socialize with one person to get those benefits? Mm -hmm. Do I skip lunch? Is that better for me? Or is having lunch with a friend where I'm getting that eye contact, is that going to cancel out the fact that I'm not Restricting. But do it all. Right. E exercise with a friend, eat a tiny salad for lunch. I think those are the best combinations. The, the problem with where we're at in technology right now and knowledge, human knowledge, is we know certain interventions individually help, but what's the best combination? We don't know that. Mm -hmm. We really don't. And this is the problem. Even in mice, we've only tested one chemical at a time. Some work, some don't. We've never done two. We've certainly never done three. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be a combination of six that gets us to 120. But who's got the time and money to do all those experiments? Right. And then, okay, so when the mice are running really fast because they've had all these longevity um, uh, infusions or in, in NAD and and have stressed out their bodies and hot and exposure to hot yeah. and cold. I this is this is just going to come. I know this is going to come off crazy, but the the role when that gets to humans and if I'm in your lab and you're and you've tested you've given me the vitamin K, the vitamin D, the NAD, the NMN, and the resveratrol for five years, and then we're going to see if I can run faster on the treadmill because of all these amazing things I've been taking and I've been taking care of myself and I've been fasting a bit, right? Trusting my body out. And then I get on that treadmill. And what if I, I'm running faster, obviously because of the, but what role does fear play? And I'm gonna fucking beat this person. I'm gonna fucking win this. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, and then how do you delineate what is from the vitamin regimen and what is from the, the will? It's hard. This is why we use mice because they don't, they don't know, <laughs> and we can have. They have nothing to prove, <laughs> right? Though uh, they, we put them on little treadmills in the lab. So cute. Yeah, they do this. But um, you know, it reminds me of. Did you ever watch Animaniacs? Pinky and the Brain. Yes. Okay, that's all I think about. Uh, yeah, they're not as cute as that. Uh, <laughs> but they, they they do run, and and when we give them this NMN, we have to talk about NAD, by the way. Oh yes, please. Yeah, right now. Sure. Okay. The reason I can get through this conversation for this long and my brain's still functioning is probably because of NAD. I've been taking it for about two years. Yeah. I've been po possibly doing it in ways that you don't think there's enough scientific evidence for doing. I was doing the drip. So maybe it was placebo effect. Wh who knows? But I was feeling a lot of benefits from that. A lot of people in California are doing it for people that are checking into treatment centers mm -hmm. for addiction. Whether it's I'm getting these benefits or I think I'm getting these benefits. So now I feel good. I right. could not tell you. But you've always been like this. But do you feel smarter than usual? Uh, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, smarter and, and by smarter, you don't mean am I retaining more knowledge is my uh, processing speed faster. That and more energy through the day. Yes. Mm. Yes. But the pandemic happened and I was doing less. So I also could have gotten more energy because I wasn't running around like a maniac driving to 10 meetings a day. Could I be. also was sleeping more. It's like a, I could probably overthink this. And I've cut toxic people out of my life. I mean, that's the other thing is like when people think about healthy living mm. and putting toxins in the people, you know, the healthiest people I know are in toxic relationships. And I'm like, how can you eat this healthy, but let all this unhealthy stuff be in your brain, it's so incongruous to me, mm -hmm. you know? So it's also simultaneously when I committed to the NAD because it was expensive, I'm doing these drips, I'm also like, I'm not gonna do the NAD and then hang out with this asshole. It's gonna undo, it defeats the whole purpose. You know what I'm saying? It's gonna cancel. So right. I, I also have to do the like um, relationship mm -hmm. hygiene of cutting out people that put 
trigger negative chemicals and the internal drug cabinet in my brain and age me. Great. Like you're aging. That's what I think to me. When I'm looking across at someone that's like, like, you know, 40 years old and still like complaining that they, you know, still not haven't worked on themselves, still judging other people, still gossiping. So, and I'm like, you're aging me. Yeah. I, I can't, this would be like me just drinking a giant slushy full of sugar talking to you. It's true. It's Why am I eating this kale salad and talking to you? It cancels each other out. Yeah, that's very smart. Definitely, you want to do friendship cleansing. Um, so NAD. Mm -hmm. NAD is a chemical in our bodies that we have high levels when we're young, and you need this chemical for, for a lot of reactions in the body. Without it, we're dead in 30 seconds or less. Um, it's used for making new protein. It's used for your brain activity. And there are defen defensive enzymes that clean the body and keep it young. And this is these are the, ge the genes and enzymes that I work on at Harvard called sirtuins. There's seven of them. And they need this chemical to work, to defend the body. And if you have high levels of NAD and you're a worm or a mouse, you're protected against diseases. And we haven't published all of this, but you tend to live longer and you, you have greater health right. as the animals. But as we get older, here's the rub is that we make less and less of this molecule and we actually get rid of it for some reason. Our bodies degrade it. So by the time you're- With and without x-rays and all the other cellular damage that we do from living in a modern- Right. I, I think it's, it's just the natural, quote unquote, natural decline. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can supplement it and get those levels back up to being young again. So I'm, what, I said 51. Um, if you took my skin, probably it would have, have half the levels of NAD as it did when I was 20. Mm. That's been published, but, but no one's measured my skin, but you know what I mean. The problem there is that, that the skin is now at the whim of all sorts of damage and you have an x-ray and you can't fix it. You go out in the sun, you get, yep. you get cancer. So the idea, and this is bearing out in animals and, and we're doing clinical trials in humans right now, is that by boosting NAD levels, the body acts young again, can defend itself again and maybe even turns back the biological clock. Hmm. Because these sirtuins, they control the epigenome. So remember that the reader of your genome is just as important. And these sirtuin defense enzymes read the genome and, and make sure that the body stays younger. What is the ideal milligram of NAD a day? In a pill form? And why don't right. you have a brand of, because when you talk about this, I, I know maybe there's like an ethic, something, I don't know, but our scientists, are you allowed to have your own line of this? Because when I hear you talk about this and then I go on Amazon, I'm like, I don't know what brand to get. I want his brand. I want one that he, his name's on. Yeah. Well, Harvard frowns on that. So that what I'm- Okay. I don't want to get okay. kicked Okay. They also frown on inclusive- comedy and they also frown on being nice to women when they run tv shows in hollywood all right well well i once was part of a supplement company when i was in my 30s and and they said if you keep doing this you will no longer be here and people who do what you're doing are no longer with us they said why so and you're gonna get so rich and i'll donate it back and buy you a freaking building don't all you want us to do is donate to the place that we already okay. paid to go to there's another reason not to do it oh and that is that i can speak as a scientist and have no conflict with you no can trust vested me. interests that's exactly right but i'm doing something that i think is even better but uh, to me i already trust you and i just want to take what you give me it's you're doing you're, i'm not losing my trust in you just because you're making money off things that you freaking discovered. Well, maybe. So So what I want to do Why is- Why does some huckster with a pyramid <laughs> scheme get to make all the money? Well, there are some professors who are selling NAD stuff and I don't trust them as much. Hmm. But, so what I- what I don't I'm, want to have to buy my NAD from a multi-level marketing scheme. Can you please just make it? <laughs> well, we've made it and it's in clinical trials. It'll eventually, if it works, become a drug that your doctor will give you for a variety of ailments, mm -hmm. maybe one day aging, which I hope will be a disease that your doctor can treat for you. Uh, but what I'm doing is, is I think even more important, which is building a company that will measure your age mm -hmm. and then recommend things that I vet to be safe, pure, and actually proven to work. And so we'd be the hub and then you can trust me that way. And won't that, and I'm happy to run this leg of your company, won't that establishment also have to have a 
psychiatric element that's like you have to take all these supplements and you need to get a divorce. You know, like, is there going to have to be a and you can't talk to that friend anymore because on your heart monitor, every time you hang out with that person, yep. your heart rate goes up. That person is making like, will that have to be a part of your. It, it will be now. That's a great idea. What's the point of taking all these supplements if you're hanging out with that guy that uh, texts you once a week and just confuses you with an eggplant emoji every now? Like, <laughs> how is it? You know, like you're the 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 neurochemicals you're producing around this person are also aging you. So we need to yeah. cut that person out. Also, I love it. Right. We'll, we'll I'll I'll run that. I'll run hygiene. the intervention side because there are a lot of things that you know. I'm sure these these drive you nuts, but um uh uh maybe I don't know. Maybe this is in aphorism or a platitude but that married people live longer in general depends on who you're married to that's what i'm saying yeah I mean, that's what i'm saying so it's like that feels like a very tricky and i'm sure with the logic behind it is like if you're a man that is in you're going to live longer because you're going to take less risks you're going to ride less motorcycles you're, you know maybe it's more that well, or you have kids, so you're just more... I don't think kids make you live longer. It doesn't feel well, that way. don't they make you m take less risks? You're like, oh, I guess I can't go have that fifth drinking or that strip club because freaking <laughs> my kid's at home. Like, doesn't it sort of the same way that that dogs are so healthy for you and animals are so healthy, you dogs in particular, because they also help you routinize your life. You have to get up at a certain time. You have to get home at a certain time. You can't stay out till four in the morning if you have a dog, at least if you're treating it humanely. So yes, all the oxytocin you're getting from snuggling with the dog is important, but <laughs> right. also the way you routinize your life more. Right, and there's also, when you get old, you have someone who'll take care of you. That's right. a big deal. So I, I would say get married at 65, 70, that's a good age. Before you <laughs> <laughs> get, and, get out there and on someone e younger than you, yeah. <laughs> make sure they're young and healthy because that that'll be their burden. But yeah, I I think marriage is it's got to be the right person. Otherwise, it it's really bad. And it's actually been proven that companionship is one of the leading predictors of longevity. But it doesn't have to be someone you're married to. Mm -hmm. If you have good friends, that is what is the greatest thing in life. Mm -hmm. Um, and that that's a Harvard study. So I think you might be able to trust that one. And is in that study, oh yeah, Harvard people who are known for being great friends. Um, there is a big sort of stigma slash uh, putting a glorification of uh, Hollywood writers that are from Harvard because uh, the the writers that come out of Harvard, at least in the last like 10 years, like these, they are just so smart and they're so, they come out to Hollywood and now all of a sudden they're, they went from Harvard to hang out with like people that were just the hottest person in their hometown. So they moved here and then they just, they think they're so smart just because they're the smartest person in a room of actors that just came here because they were pretty. And you're like, okay, you're dumb in Boston. You're smart because you're in Hollywood. Like, don't get this ego that you're the smartest person on the planet just because you're smarter than these five <laughs> models. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I work there every day. There's some really smart people there. Mm -hmm. Actually, just in my department, I think there's three Nobel Prize winners. In there. I know, but people aren't coming out of your department and coming and write on The Simpsons. No, that's for sure. People are like, I went to Harvard and I write a cartoon. I'm smarter than all of you. It's like, okay, you write a cartoon child. Let's just, let's, you write fart jokes. Let's just be easy. Like, I'm sick of being shamed by people in Hollywood that went to Harvard. I went to Penn. It's a pretty good school, but we don't, we have shame and we have low self esteem. So, well, you've got to have arrogance at Harvard to survive. Interesting. Yeah. What? I don't know. It's an uncomfortable silence. Oh, <laughs> I love uncomfortable silences because you're, you're so measured in the way you talk. Like, I'm fascinated by you. You will not say any more than you need to say. And if something's a yes or no, there's so few people in my life or my world that will just go, yeah, no. It makes for a terrible podcast, right? No, but it's just fascinating to me because the answer is either yes or no. You're a scientist. There's no gray area. It's yes or no. Whereas I'm like, yeah, because they're also, look, it could be true. Like I can argue not two sides of the same. I, I contradict myself every other sentence I say, but you're just like, nope, the answer's no. Well, it has to be because my whole career, our career as a scientist, mm -hmm. are people constantly calling bullshit on you. So you, you have to just make sure that you're always speaking the truth every and moment. And what is that dynamic? Because it's, it's the smartest people in the world. You're in such rare company. And the only people that can really relate to you or understand you 
or maybe make you feel less alone or these people that think like you, but they're also in a way your adversaries no, or referees. They make me feel alone all the time. Really? Uh, that they are adversaries. There's there's a lot of competition. How come they've got a Nobel Prize and I don't? That's not fair. Are Nobel Prizes like Oscars where they're kind of just bought? Or are they really earned? They're definitely earned. Okay. They're definitely earned. But um, but you're not allowed to talk about it. If you say so-and-so should get a Nobel Prize or, oh, you know, maybe my, my latest work is worth a Nobel Prize, that's really bad. You, you don't talk about you have the to N-word. do amazing, amazing work but not think it's amazing. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is perfect for an Australian. Got it. You know how to do that. We do, but but it's real. Mm-hmm. It's real. I, I don't think I'm that smart. I, I just do what I think is fun. But in my department, it's really scary. I've got the imposter syndrome there because I'm, I'm sitting around tables with people who are famous and change the world. And I'm thinking, yeah. But you're at that I, table. Well, you I am. Be of there. Course, I They're thinking the same I thing about you. I think I belong there. But that's part of why you're so good is that you... It doesn't a little imposter syndrome go a long way in terms of not being an imposter because you work so hard that you'll never be one if you fear being one. True. That's why I do try so hard because I want to be accepted, mm-hmm. like, like you said. Yes. The only reason that I got learned a, a vocabulary other than the fact that I kind of knew I was going to talk for a living is I was so insecure that I wasn't mm. smart that I would just study dictionaries when I was a yeah, kid. Yeah, you have a, an amazing vocabulary. Thank you. I noticed. Thank you. Yeah. I can't pronounce half the words in this book, and I've I've delicately tiptoed around them with prosaic words. But um, I'm going to do a little speed round with you, and then I know I have to let you go because you have to go save the world. And I feel guilty when I'm keeping people like you here, like I'm stopping progress of like humanity if I keep you in my house too much. And then I also want to talk about some of the businesses you're starting. Um, your friend that you brought today is named Whitney, so she well, is, she brought me. She brought <laughs> she did she um uh. Uh, Whitney Casey, I want to talk about the business you're starting and um, how valuable real scientists are in like businesses moving forward and what's that like? Because, you know, I find even sometimes when I'm the most well-intentioned in some business things, there's certain things that I just don't know, are, you know, power or, or corporations, when things become commodified, there's always going to be a little undertone of evil. And how do we fight that? Like, for example, I invested in Lime scooters. And I'm like, this is great. People aren't going to have to have ca- have cars. And it's it's not elitist. Transportation isn't elitist anymore. And anyone can grab it. Emergency room visits in LA went up 60%. Oh, no. <laughs> Like this benevolent instinct, like I was like, oh no, now I'm like helping people just like break their necks all day. You know, it's just sort of this double-edged sword of when you're taking a benevolent cause into business and the very real, you know, emotional costs of it or the the things you just have to settle with of going like, you know, for me, I just invested in the company that I was like, I don't know if this is ethically a sound company, but if I didn't take this piece of the pie, someone would. Someone who's a bad person, maybe a good person should take it because what I'm going to use with the money is actually going to be beneficial to because I can donate the money, whereas some psychopath wouldn't and they would just keep it to build their, you know, eugenics program at debutante balls across whatever. Exactly. That's the reason to make money because you, you will spend it wisely. Right. So a lot of the, I think the best people and the most ethical people are like, no, I don't want to capitalize on this or no, I don't want to cash out on this. That feels wrong. You're the exact person that probably should. It's like all the people that want to run for president, I don't think should ever run. Anyone that wants to run is inherently disqualified. Right. You know, I think they should just go up to like a good person one day who like runs a car dealership and be like, you're the president. It should be like, and you're like, oh, <laughs> shit, I don't want to do that. And they'd probably be the best. Right. Probably same in marriage. Just random is probably better than people that you're attracted That's to. That's really funny. I mean, it's, if you have not done work on yourself, right? Because for me, I remember going to my uh, therapist who I think you would love. She's very, um, you know, into, you know, attachment strategies and like inherited fears and, you know, nothing's your fault. That's irrational addiction, really? how it's to switch your bad addictions to good addictions. Don't over pathologize yourself with addictions. Just choose a healthy addiction, yeah. you know, reroute. Those are actually all of the things we pathologize and perceived, you know, by society, weaknesses and character flaws are actually superpowers. They're just, you've directed the energy in the wrong place. Your porn addiction, turn that into writing that book, how to reroute that energy and retrain your brain. I'll consider it. And 
<laughs> and um, where am I going with that? Oh, is that the people I remember going to um, uh, her once when I was in, in my 20s and I had just gotten out of a really toxic, bad relationship. I had been in a lot of bad relationships. It's his fault. It's his fault. The common denominator was me in all of them. And I went up to her and I had found someone that was in my field, but adjacent to me. So I wasn't going to emasculate them or I wasn't, there wasn't going to be some weird power imbalance or uncomfortable um, jealousies or anything. And I went up to her and I was like, this is who I think, this is who I'm going to date next. He does charity work and he does this and he's this and he's been divorced and he has a kid. So he's calmed down and he has less testosterone and this is perfect. <laughs> I had it all figured out and she just looks and she goes, you can't date him. And I was like, why? Do you know something about him? What is that? No, he's like the perfect guy. And she's like, you cannot date this person. And I was like, why? And she goes, because you're attracted to him. Wow. If you're attracted to someone, uh -huh. that's a red flag. Oh, come on. Well, at the time, I was recreating my childhood circumstances and I was magnetically attracted to people that created chaos, made me insecure, made me re uh, sort of feel that warm hug of dysfunction and drama. I could walk into a room and within 20 minutes be talking to the most damaged, sick, <laughs> manipulative, dishonest, sociopathic person and like mm -hmm. be in love. We call them Christmas trees. Like I'm just like, they just light up for us. And because boredom, I, I, I you know, she finally explained to me, what is boring to you is actually just serenity. So if you're bored mm -hmm. in a relationship, it's probably just healthy. Got it. Well, no, no uh, disrespect to your, to your relationship, but why did you say you want men with lower testosterone? <laughs> At the time, I was just looking for excuses for why it wasn't my fault. And I was looking for everyone else needed to fix themselves because I was perfect, right? Which is whatever my ego had to develop in my childhood when um, primary caretakers were not perfect and there was a lot of mental illness around. The only way to stay safe was don't cause any problems, be perfect, be a straight A student. This is going to minimize any backlash or discomfort mm -hmm. or punishment i can't outshine anyone but i also need to be perfect like like that people pleasing of like shape shifting for narcissists and, and and mentally ill people so that i was in less danger all but the why time. testosterone Te aggression or because i think drive? in my head i was like if a guy has too much testosterone uh -huh. he's gonna cheat he's gonna get on motorcycles he's gonna have to chase strange what do the kids call it these days he's gonna be a philanderer hmm. he's gonna you know test i had this thing in my head that was like too much testosterone is bad and it was also at a time that i was on a birth control that i talked about this in my third special about um there was a study that came out that said uh, women that are on certain birth controls because they smell pheromones differently because b birth control basically makes your body think it's pregnant right so you're yeah. essentially when you're on birth control you're pregnant for all intents and purposes and we're attracted to men that are more quote alpha risk takers when we're on birth control because it's mm -hmm. our body's way of saying i'm vulnerable i'm about to have a child to protect i need the strongest biggest most tattooed guy that wears axe body spray instead of you know the dork who's actually probably going to be the better husband so they say go off if you get engaged to someone don't marry them until you've gone off birth control for a year to make sure you're still attracted got to them it. So, it so when i'm going to pick up a woman i ask are you on birth control <laughs> That'll cut cut to the chase. <laughs> and if they are, just be like, all right, I rode my yeah, motorcycle. There's that other guy. <laughs> <laughs> Pull out your chair, your brass knuckles. <laughs> you know, so just sort of those, like, it changes something with your olfactory glands or something. But I, I'm just fascinated by, uh, you know, what we're attracted to is not always good for us emotionally or physically. I want to have pizza every day. That doesn't mean I can. Right. That's the thing I'm most attracted to. But chances are I probably should just have that kale salad, even though it's not what I want to have the affair with. Right. You just summarized everything that I believe in, which is that what makes us, gives us pleasure isn't always what's good for us. Mm. But it's that served us one because I think it's important to be able to something we do in 12 step programs is if you have negative instincts or fears, you anthropomorphize them and you kind of make them sort of uh, um, you basically turn them into you can turn them into a character, you can name your shadow. There's lots of different ways of doing it. Uh, but you go, so if I meet a new friend, a potential new girlfriend, Whitney Casey over here. I have so much um, in my hippocampus is so chock full of negative relationships with women. I grew up around a lot of mental illness, borderline personality disorder, women that um, had very big emotions, a lot of them justifiably so, uh, you know, having to work and care for kids and yeah. be overwhelmed in the sexist environment and all the stresses they were under. And so women just always, to me, 
when I was in female friendships, it was a, I was attracted to women that were very mercurial and needed to be rescued where I would sort of caretake them in a maternal way. And I would sort of check out of my own life by obsessing over their drama. And it was ultimately patronizing to them because I'm like, this grown woman needs me to take care of her. That's so narcissistic and such a God complex thing. But I always sort of for women, I couldn't let them too far in because I always felt like they would hurt me because they were irrational mm -hmm. and they were emotional and deeply on some level jealous and I couldn't outshine them and I had to minimize myself. So hanging out with women because of the women that I was around when I was a child, I thought all women were dangerous emotionally and that you had to make yourself small. You had to shape shift. You mm -hmm. had to not be too pretty, but you had to be funny, but not funnier than them. And it was exhausting to me, but that was all shit I was mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. And where are we go where am I going with that? You know. Well, I know that that you like taking care of people and animals, and that makes you a good person. Yeah, but sometimes when we care take other people, it's selfish and it's for our own ego. It depends on what our motives are. Like this is what we're gonna get into when I have my little kiosk at your longevity lab that where I'm gonna tell people to get out of bad marriages and cut off well, toxic people. No, you don't have to go to that baby shower. You do not have to. If anything's out of obligation, you do not have to do it. Well, you, we're going into business. You already have figured out what we're going to do. Yeah, no, I'm going to I'm going to be um like the life coach in the corner that tells people to get out of bad marriages. No, you don't have to talk to that person if they if they were late three times, like mm -hmm. you're done. They don't respect your time. There's no conversation. You don't stay in this relationship and just get mad at, and cuz resentment ages mm -hmm. us, right? When we drink poison and wait for the other person to die, you know, when mm -hmm. we're angry mm -hmm. at people, when we, you know, w what do you make of like this addiction to self-righteous indignation on the internet now? Like this is one of the things that is going to like mess up the bell curve in terms of combating longevity is the fact that people are going on the internet and just right. raging. Exactly. Exactly. So that this is, again, what I'm writing about in this new book is that the world we've I'll, built look, I'll is write a killing chapter. us. Fine. After, after we go into business together, <laughs> the, the three of us, yes, this please. new company. By the way, do you know Steve Jobs? You know that, um, you, do, have you heard of him? I just mean, remember the Steve Jobs movie? I don't know if this happened in real life or not, but remember in the movie, he had two assistants named Billy and he's like, Billy, you're Jim. Like he just had to change the person's name because he didn't have time to for confusion. Well, you, you both have the same initials, which is a bit confusing. That's so wild. What's your middle name, Whitney Casey? Brooke. Okay, that's right. Whitney Brooke Casey. Mine's A and W A C whack. It's weird. So how do you choose? Your time is so valuable, even though you're going to live to be 200. So maybe, you know, there's not the same scarcity accomplished with you. How do you choose what businesses to start and which ones to mm. not and how to use your time? No one's ever asked me that. Thank you. Um, I, let me think. So highest impact on the planet. So the reason I exist, the reason I want to exist uh, is to leave the world a better place. I know that sounds sick, but that's what I've wanted to do. Was since it like I was that before you had kids? It it was even stronger before I had kids. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no, now I made these really smart kids. They can solve it. Yeah. <laughs> My work's done. <laughs> right. Uh, no, seriously, when I was four, I, I was told that I have to make the world a better place. This is my grandmother's influence. Mm. And so I do that every day I've gotten up. This has been my goal. And so I pick businesses based on solving problems and then figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what Whitney and I and you <laughs> are going to do is to help people figure out how to be well in a scientific way, not just go on to online and hope for the best that that supplement is actually what they say it is, or that that gym equipment actually works, or this aura ring is going to help you. That's what I want to do is to put science into wellness. In a way that people can have proof in their own lives that what they're doing is working or to be, hold themselves accountable in a way that they can't be delusional about it. Yeah, it's both. It's both. I want people to be, we want people to be cognizant of the, of the, the fact that they can change their lifespan mm -hmm. and their health, but also give them feedback. We can now we have technology out mm. of my lab that can tell you how you're doing mm. in terms of your age, your biological age. We can mm -hmm. measure that quickly and cheaply, just mm -hmm. a mouth swab. But also other things, future fertility, skin, these kind of things we're going to add to that. And when, when you get feedback, then you really think about it. Otherwise, you just go, oh, whatever. I don't care when I'm 60. But if you can see when you're going to die, mm. you pay more attention to it. There's going to be some kind of 
like insurance break if you're on the Sinclair KC thing, right? There's going to be some kind of, because humans, right, in order to be motivated, they either have to have super negative consequences or something like really positive, like a, like a financial, if it's like you pay a thousand dollars less a year in your insurance, if you're on the right. Sinclair KC. Don't give away all our secrets. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Like I just see, I see that so clearly. I just yeah. see it so clearly. It's like clearly. a good driving record. Yes. And people will know because all the algorithm, they're looking at all our data anyway. They're looking at your Amazon purchases and adjusting your insurance accordingly. So they're yeah. going to- Well, if you have a bad result and you're 10 years older, you don't have to show it to anybody. But if you're if you're younger, by all means, you got a ticket. Do you ever have time to read fiction? Occasionally. There's this, you're, you're like a lot of scientists, a lot of scientists put out fiction. What do you mean? <laughs> like, I feel like that's how competitive you guys are. Yeah, I just read a couple studies from Stanford that read like fiction. <laughs> yeah, the worst are from Stanford. <laughs> really? <laughs> really, Stanford's the worst. Um, Huberman, I mean, yeah, you I don't, mean, don't believe Huberman. what, what are we he talking? says. Well, Andrew Huberman, who's like, you know, been on the podcast, will be on the podcast again. I remember one day, like, like taking his advice so uh seriously that i forgot to use common sense like you know he has this thing that's like go out in the morning and look into the sun and look at horizons and i like went outside like before my car and i just would like get a headache and i was like okay don't stare at the sun that cannot be what a brilliant scientist is telling me to do let me rewatch that video and it was close your eyes and look at it don't look i was like looking directly into eclipse like this can't be this is the latest science i guess it's good stressing out my body stressing out my optical this is regenerating my eyes right now you know so there are times when like i will just you know people like me dumb idiots like me can take science and like still hurt ourselves with it yeah. if we don't really understand like and you starting this business clearly seems like it's bridging between this sort of science you would need a degree to understand and putting it in a way that's accessible to the exactly. i don't want to say average person but the person who doesn't have a doctorate exactly well so i'm the science brain and whitney over here is the rest of it which is how to make things simple and easy mm -hmm. for people um, that makes sense because I'm going to make it too complicated. Mm -hmm. But w Whitney's built companies for consumers before, so it's a it's a good match. Fascinating. Mm. Okay, I'm going to do a really quick speed round. Uh, some people have sent questions that we know very well. Jennifer Aniston and Sandra Bullock have questions, and I have got to answer them. They are listening. Sorry, gals, I'm just getting into it now. Mev Foreman, you are on. You take it at night. Uh, no, I don't take it at night. I take it. How dare you disagree with me in front in of my fans? In the morning. Fans. Oh, I thought you took it at night. Well, I, I maybe I used to, but I found that it, it just sits in my stomach and causes pain. Yeah, I, I'm quite sensitive to it. It, it hurts my stomach. It feels How many uh, milligrams do you take? Uh, I take, depends on the day and whether I'm working out, but a gram. Uh, one gram. Which is a low dose. I mean, a diabetic will take two grams. Okay. It, for, okay. for those of you who don't know, metformin is a diabetes drug. And you need a doctor to get it. That manages your glucose levels, therefore um, helping fight against cancer and aging. Yeah, yeah, something like that. It brings down the sugar levels, but mm -hmm. also it's been found just by looking at tens of thousands of people who have taken it, that they're healthier than people that don't have type 2 diabetes. Hmm. So it, it seems to be a magical drug. So many people in Hollywood take it. I do know that. Oh, do they? Yeah. Well, Along with drinking the baby blood. You know, they go, they sell them at the same I don't think you drink through. the baby blood. Oh. Okay. I don't know, but I've heard, I, I did, I did Joe Rogan's podcast, like whatever it was, like a couple weeks ago. And I don't know what he says, something about my, my skin or something. He's like, you look healthy. And I was like, yeah, it's all the baby blood that I'm eating. Like the QAnon conspiracy, right? Yeah. Like joking about it. I had just, um, watched the QAnon documentary and then the rabbit hole is a podcast, uh, New York Times podcast that's sort of about how people get sucked into QAnon. And, and I'm always obsessed with how humans sort of are, uh, predisposed to be conned or on some level participate mm. in being conned because they feel like they're a part of something. Just how vulnerable we are to bullshit is fascinating to me. Um, and then John Bojar is my favorite philosopher and how, you know, things that are real have been duplicated and artificial so many times. By the time we see the real thing, we think it's fake. You know, that's like I was just in Sedona in Arizona and I got there and I was like, this looks like the screensaver on my... <laughs> It's prettier on my screensaver. Like when you see the real thing, right? It's actually not even as impressive because and it's, you're so it's used to less hot when it's on the computer. Yes, yeah. exactly. And you're just kind of like, oh, this is hot and sticky. I used to be able to watch this just like I saw this beautiful view, like in my and office in the you're air putting hoodies on. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, well, and also, um, just kind of the the. 
our art of so much of in our life is artificial mm -hmm. to the point to where I remember the first time I had grapes as a t like kid, I had already had like grape runts and grape bubblicious gum and grape gum is so much better than grapes. Isn't By the it? time you have real grapes, you're like, Bleh! what is this trash? Yeah, you know what grapes will do to you? It'll spike your blood sugar massively, I found out. But we like the resveratrol that comes from the skin. Uh, yeah, we found years ago that it made fat mice as healthy as the thin mice and they live just as long as the thin mice. So it's like mimicking being skinny without having to watch what you eat. Interesting. You're so you're not eating grapes. You're not popping grapes. You're not. No, I stopped eating like grapes a few years ago because I, I had, you know, you can monitor your blood sugar. You, you can put a little thing on. I don't know. You're just covered in devices. You're like ex machina. Yes. Okay. I do know that. I now. believe in science. Okay. Yeah. So I put that on my arm. Okay. And I could see when I ate something, what my sugar levels were over Whoa. the next few hours. And grapes were the worst. Yeah. It, it but what spiked. if you're on metformin and eating grapes? Like, here's my thing is a lot of times, when I, f it's like, I'm like whack-a-mole, the way my brain wants to manipulate around. So I go, if I'm taking metformin, I can have this piece of cake. Whereas if I wasn't on metformin, I wouldn't eat the cake. So sometimes humans, when we do something healthy, like supplements, we're like, well, I'm taking these supplements so I can eat cake. this other trash. Yeah. Yeah. And you can eat it. Um, I don't know about that, but the occasional cake's not going to kill you. Right, right. I just mean like the way that our brains go, I'm doing this healthy thing. To justify that. that. Yes. Yeah. Like, oh, it cancels it out. The, the, the lies we tell ourselves in order to. Right. I'll take an NAD fusion, infusion and I'll smoke. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. While I'm doing it. So it's not true. This is really important. You're listening? Yes. I'm. Okay. The, if you take a healthy mouse and give it what we are talking about, resveratrol or some of these other things, mm -hmm. they get even fitter and stronger and live longer. So it's not an excuse to sit on the couch and watch movies just if you take something that I'm taking. But I think that's an important thing to talk about with people because I think, you know, when I first hear this information from a forward-facing scientist, I'm then like, oh, I'm doing all this healthy stuff. Now I can go do all this other unhealthy stuff. You know, it's not permission to mm -hmm. behave like a dickhead to yourself. Right. Right. You want to maximize it. So that's why I do everything that I can. And this company is going to help people realize like, just because you did this doesn't mean you have extra credit points in some arsenal where you get to act like a shithead and do dumb shit. And I take resveratrol, so I don't have to wear sunscreen. Like just the way that our non-scientific, our emotional brains give us fake permission. Exactly. And this will tell you if you're doing a good job or not. And when we've done millions of people, we'll know are those people that do those things mm -hmm. are the ones that age backwards or slower. Mm -hmm. And also knowing how long you're in the sun. Like, you know, there are times you're like, I never got in the sun. You're like, but did you drive for 45 minutes today? Did you walk? Like there's times that you don't count that bad things are happening or that exposed to things because you just don't know to count it. I had horrible sun damage on my hand. I, I when I was, uh, cause I would drive to and from school every day, high school. And there was a sunroof that would go right onto my hands every day. And I just didn't think about it. You don't put sunscreen on your hands. No one told me to do that. You put it on your face, right? This was also a time when I was going to tanning beds three times a day. So mm. there was, I know, but I looked cute. I <laughs> was so hot though. That is true. Um, I was just like a, um, uh, just a caramel queen of, of <laughs> Bethesda. And, <laughs> Then I come out to LA. I've never been in California. I come out to do some like UCLA theater program. I got in the sun, put sunscreen everywhere except my hands. And then I started getting these giant blisters. I went into UCLA, the emergency room, and I, I didn't really understand the concept of like a teaching hospital because it was at a university. Uh -huh. And the, the doctor came in and like was like, <clears throat> and then started calling in other students and they started taking photos of it to like put in a textbook. I was like, this can't. Be I guess it's my first big publication I'm in. Am I on the cover? <laughs> like, but just sort of, I didn't realize, like, I would need a device to tell me, hey, dumbass, mm. you think you've only been in the sun for 10 minutes today to get your dose of vitamin D, but you also walked the dog, you drove, sun comes through glass, dummy. Thank you. That That's the future. Um, where's that little device? So this um, thing that I stuck on my it. chest. I ate it. I swallowed it. Please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to look inside you yet. But this device combined with what we're doing mm -hmm. in our new company, perhaps one day it'll be the same company, is that it'll be able to tell you everything about your body, wow. uh, how you're doing, your age, your fertility, your sex drive, but also hopefully how to fix it all. And combined with these things, it'll also be able to tell you uh, where you are, which restaurant to go to, which is the best food if you want to try mm. it. Right? If you've been out in the sun, watch out. But then a restaurant's gonna start buying that. Is that gonna be corrupted? This is where good intentions go sideways. Like what if 
the restaurant's like, I'll give you a million dollars if you suggest my restaurant. Well, that's okay as long as we get 40%. <laughs> like, is that going to start happening? It might, you right? Know, vouchers ways, for health. Why on not? Ways, it'll be like, take left at a Burger King. And I'm yeah. like, How about that you, was definitely paid for. Your health insurance will pay for it. Good point. If, as long as you eat the right meal. Good point. And then, okay, this is a speed round. I know I have to let you go. Do liquid aminos work? Sure. That you put on your salad? For what? General vibrancy? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, as long as they're not full of those uh, leucine, valine, isoleucine, branch chain amino acids, you're good. Mm -hmm. But yeah, quick like, absorption. Yeah, like would you ever put that on your salad, like Dr. Bragg's liquid aminos? No. It, no. No, because I, I believe if you eat a healthy, balanced salad, it's got enough. You don't need those. There. If you're adding stuff, you're probably not eating well to begin with. Uh, I wouldn't say that, but I would say amino acids are very hard to be deficient in. Hmm. Oh, got it. Okay, so that's a scam. Got it. Um, let me ask you about protein-rich plasma topically on the skin. Is that real? Well, uh, so there are peptides that seem to boost the skin's thickness. That are topical or that are injectable? Um, I certainly know about the topical experiments. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just trying one out right now that was sent to me. The signs look good. I think it's working. Mm, you put it on your skin every day? Uh, yeah, for the last month or so, two months maybe. Okay. Um, so I, I'd like to experiment those what, that, that way. And how but I should really do half my face. That would right? have been <laughs> I used to do that for QVC. I used to do um, like home shopping network stuff and they would put self tanner on one side of my face and not the other to show the difference. And then I was in like half black face, like walking around Philadelphia as yeah. a nightmare. I, I didn't want to show up on, on your podcast yeah, with half not. an ugly face. Uh, yeah. We'll put it in in post, don't worry. Um, so uh, EMFs. The idea that phones have radiation. You say you don't fly a lot on planes. Emily was around when I used to wear, I would wear a suit on a plane that was supposed to block EMFs. I actually was like in talks with Under Armour about, because I was trying to figure out what blocks EMFs and how to apply that to baby clothes and to like cribs and paint because so many people live near cell phone towers and so many people live near whatever, like how to... You know, and then remember, we were powering off all our devices in the home. I was told that these EMFs from our cell phones and cell phone towers, our body can regenerate mm. from it, but it just never has a break. Were you told by a real scientist? <laughs> this was a psychic that worked out of her home in Venice. I paid her by check. How dare you? Emily says no. I have no, I have no idea. So I'm just, you say you don't fly. Is that, is, is cell phone radiation? That doesn't. I'm not worried about cell phones. Not worried at all. No, I, I've looked into it. There's no evidence. Great. But flying is a different type of radiation. It's coming from the sun. It strips your DNA, breaks so it's, it. it hits the plane or only if your window's open? Do you open the windows? <laughs> Sorry, I, I, mean, I mean, if you're, the thing's up and the sun's coming. I know that sun- No, these things pass straight almost through lead. You, it's hard to stop them. So the more we fly, the more our DNA is being damaged. Yeah, and try going to Mars and, and not getting cancer. That's a problem. So we work on that as a problem too, because Elon doesn't yet think it's a big problem. It's not worried about getting cancer. He should be. Right. But the kind of person is, is that like part of the reason why Michael Phelps, uh, you know, was such a good swimmer is he had some kind of defect that made his heart bigger and his body like perfectly designed to swim a certain way. Tiger Woods or whatever his gift was, Lance Armstrong, whatever his gift was. And part of the gifts of these people, like Alan, is like, a brain miswiring that makes him not afraid of doing something most people should be afraid of, which is why would Amelia Earhart have gotten in that fucking plane? That was mm -hmm. so dumb. She must have had some kind of, you know, amygdala deformity that made her not scared of that. Sure, but that's no excuse for stupidity. Yeah. No, no offense, Elon. Who, no, I'm a big like, fan. But, but do we need his sort of blind spot and whatever the arrogance is that says, I'm not going to get this despite the science? Is that the kind of person you need in order to forge ahead for something like space? Travel? Yes. I mean, there's a huge risk uh, that people will take, but it's a risk that you don't have to take. You could boost the body's defenses against these cosmic rays, gamma rays, and mm. other things. Um, and so it's one of the things we worked on with NASA. We we won some NASA award for not just shielding the spacecraft. Which I think you've would... won so many awards that it's like, it's some award. Oh, stop. It's, no. <laughs> it's somewhere in my basement. Well, I didn't even know why I said that. But what we were saying is instead of shielding the spacecraft, which would take a meter of water, which you'd know is three feet, mm -hmm. you can actually take a pill and protect the DNA from the inside. So that's a simple solution. Alon won't take the pill? Yeah, he will. 
We'll see. I'll ask him. He will take it. Why not? It, there's nothing to lose. It's We've tested these molecules in hundreds of people now, so there's nothing. There's a certain recklessness and abandon that's needed to be one of these elite people, right? Like the fact that you were like, I'm going to change the world. Like most people would say that and they would be delusional, like people that you would put in an insane asylum if they said something like that. Like what's the difference between someone that just says that and is a crazy person on the street that you would cross the street if they say, I'm going to change the world. You'd be like, oh, that person's crazy. You said There's it. There's not much of a difference, actually. <laughs> You've said it, and the only reason you're not like a scary schizophrenic person is because you actually did it. Well, I figured out how to do it, starting with the goal in mind, and then I had to be good at science. Mm. I had to get a PhD. I had to go to MIT to get experience in aging research. It's all been part of an execution plan. So I'm crazy, you but have to be equal at least I plan ahead. Crazy and reckless, but also strategic and disciplined. It's that that per, that's why people like you are so rare because it's so odd to have that combination. Yeah, and and you have to be scientific and creative at the same time, which I would say Elon has that. And uh, is uh, gut bacteria is this a big thing on your? list whose question is this uh, this is i've got i've got questions from very famous people i'm not going to embarrass them by saying which questions are wh from which people but there's a lot of probiotics and and i drink kombucha and I, I i think i feel better when i drink it and have billions of bacteria good gut bacteria but are is this something that's a priority in your life if not i'm gonna just throw it all out uh no there's some good science behind it the microbiome is very important and it changes as we get older Mm. And it's been shown, at least in fish, I think in mice too, that if you put young back, young mouse bacteria into an old mouse, mm. certainly in a fish, they live longer. So it, the science isn't really there for humans yet. Right. We're, we're not eating young people's feces A lot yet. of people on Reddit think we are <laughs> in Hollywood on Epstein's plane. <laughs> and a lot of people would argue with you on that. Yeah, so I, I think microbiome and, and, and some of the the replacement makes sense scientifically. I haven't seen a lot of studies that say it changes your life yet, but probiotics, there's some science behind it. I wouldn't the throw it out, put it that way. Two famous actresses who are known for their perfect skin and bodies have some questions. Um, thoughts on peptides, injectable peptides. I am on them. Mm -hmm. and? and I'm 76. How do <laughs> yeah. I look? We have to measure your age with this new test. And then, and then we'll know. Oh, God. Uh, no one will believe that I'm 38. The irony is I'm 38 and I'm just like, ah, I don't buy it. That's right. We'll change your name just in case. So what? Um, so peptides. Yes. Do you do them? No. Why not? Uh, well, I put that that cream has a peptide in it. So that's my first foray into it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've, I've called up friends to ask who know this stuff. Uh, I even talked to Andrew. I know. Andrew Huberman. Huberman. I sent mine to him. The ones that I'm taking... And I am on, I, uh, 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 hold on. I'm just looking through our Sam Morellin, Sir Morellin. Mm -hmm. And I do one at night and one in the morning. Okay. So the answer is maybe. Okay. But they haven't been studied enough. There's See, that's someone like me. A maybe is a yes. <laughs> as long as this it guy doesn't might be you. interested in me. I'll turn that. I'll turn a maybe into a yes any day. I made yeah. a career out of it. <laughs> Well, that, that's fine. You know, a lot of the stuff that I take isn't proven to work either. There's just a lot of evidence. Right. Um, but if we wait another 30 years, you know, that's too late. Because my question is like, not only do peptides work for us, but can I put them in my dogs? Oh, even less evidence. But but even more important. You don't want to experiment on no, your I best don't. friends. No, no. No, it's better if, if you end up with problems. Right. Yeah, no, I, trust me, I agree. Uh, uh, thoughts on... Bio photomodulation, light therapy. On oh, health? that's interesting too. Mm. Uh, yes. Whoever's listening, the famous A list actress, you know, you asked that and I didn't. So don't give me the credit for <laughs> okay. being an interesting question. All right. So the, the expansion on that is that I've seen some good evidence that it can help with hair growth mm. so that you can get these. I light really things. do want to grow my pubes back. I lasered them off in my 20s and it's I miss them now. <laughs> <laughs> but what about infrared light saunas would you do that or do you um i probably would do it it would feel good mm -hmm. at, at the very least like a 
cryotherapy, which I did with uh, Joe Rogan. That that made me feel. The problem good. is like we, the amount of time. Like you have it's a full time job. By the time you get in the sauna, and then you get in the cold plunge, and then you get in the light therapy, and then you know what I mean. It's like Mm-mm. what do we prioritize? If you we can bring only- a friend, you eat a salad, you read a book, mm-hmm. do it all. So the light therapy, I think there's some. So the, there's infrared, deep infrared, near infrared. It can penetrate the skin, mm. um, and I think it's changing the uh, the epigenome. Mm-hmm. Um, that hair study makes me believe that stem cells in your head might get reactivated. Hmm. So it's plausible. A lot of people were injecting PRP in needles of their own PRP into bald spots. I don't know if it was working or not. Uh, I, I've seen that it does help. Hmm. Uh, and I've read all these these studies. And uh, so that makes sense. There are peptides and all sorts of things in PRP. Mm-hmm. It'd be better if we knew what worked and we just put those on our heads. Right. But then it's also the idea of like, you're doing all this stuff, but this is part of what your company, I, I assume, is going to do, which is like, yes, you're doing all this infrared light, but you're also not eating this or taking this. So there's no point in doing this if you're not in conjunction with these other two things. Exactly. Nothing is like an isolated, you know, panacea for something. Yeah, that's exactly right. And And right now, as you have just said, we have no idea what works for us. And we're all different. Mm. How do we know that eating that or doing that or shining that is good for us? Mm Because we're all different. We have different gut microbiomes, of course, a lot different genes, different epigenomes. Mm -hmm. Even twins are different. Twins have different lifespans, identical twins, because they live differently. Benton ate his twin in the womb, I think. So that one had a very short (laughs) lifespan. Um, sorry, really quick, and I know, and then I'm gonna let you go. I know I have to. Um, your lifespan, you're like, is getting shorter and shorter as he's sitting here. I'm consuming all of your lifespan. Um, I know you have to get to this book because it answers your next book, which because it answers a question I would like to know the answer to. Um, but is there anything to if you're genetically predisposed to be bald at a young age? Could that be something that benefits you? You might not know why, but it is auspicious to you or the person that is experiencing it because of how everything else in your body is designed, how it evolved and how your family's trauma and stuff. Like how much of genetics do we want to change? Like, is there anything you're always like, let's not mess with this because this is auspicious for this person that were designed this way for a reason to react to certain circumstances? Like, we can't make white Arctic foxes blue. They are white for a reason. That helped them. We can make them blue. I know, but we should. They would be more likely to die. That is true. That is true. But they'd be prettier. That's very true. And then they'd be just as important. Yeah, then they would be more likely to be captured and put in a zoo and maybe they'd live longer when they're in conservation. Who knows? Now you're thinking. Yeah, see? I'm pro zoo all of a sudden. Did you see that? (laughs) No, but is there anything like 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 changing in our lifetime when I have kids, my eggs are frozen and I'm about to freeze embryos, right? So and I would like to use your sperm if that's okay. I can't imagine that would be weird at all. Um, but changing the eye color of a kit. So you've already had children. Right now, let's say you go for another one in Five years, you'll be able to tinker with the eye color, right? Of course. Of course. I mean, and technology is there. Would you? I mean, you have beautiful blue eyes. This is like Hitler's dream of a Thanks. palette. I've never been called that. <laughs> <laughs> He's like blue eyes. But if you knew your kid was going to have brown eyes and you're like, I know based on science that kids with blue eyes do better in life. They get hired faster. They have more choice of their spouse or their whatever. Their life is easier, mm-hmm. you know? You have to do what would make your kid have a head start. It's Gattaca all over again. I mean, it's Good your movie. kid, so it already has a head start. But uh, So I, I think that we should fix humanity mm. any way we can, as long as it's safe and ethical. I think changing the color of eyes right now, it's not safe enough. And there's not a good enough reason. But I know it's an example. But if we change the color of eyes, let me ask you, does are blue eyes more uh, susceptible to damaging yes. UV rays? So. You could be putting, actually making their experience uh, more dangerous by giving them this aesthetic change if blue eyes mean more eye cancer or whatever. Exactly. Right. So that's why I wouldn't do that. But if I could protect them against cancer by putting Mm -hmm. an extra few copies of what's called the P53 gene, Mm -hmm. I would do that, Mm -hmm. especially if it was perfectly safe and only cost me $10. Would you tell them? Yes. That's that's why. Yes, of course. But, but, But is there anything to doing it? But not because t- if I know that 
oh, I'm 10 years old. My dad is David Sinclair and he rejiggered my DNA so I'm never going to get cancer. All right, now I'm just going to like drink soda all day because I'm never going to get cancer. I see a point. Uh, what if you don't yeah. tell them? Just be like, cancer runs in our family. So not only do you know they're not going to get it, but they're also going to take care of themselves and live longer. Yeah. I think there's a good My point, main then. advice is lie to children, you guys. <laughs> it's a very healthy, I don't know what this new thing is where you don't abuse children psychologically. It works. You know, like I feel like there's going to have to be something down the line mm -hmm. that's going to have to be intentionally a little bit duplicitous in order to reap the benefit and not have a benefit backfire. Well, they might be stigmatized if they're known as the genetically modified babies, but I think eventually most children, if not all, will be. I know mm -hmm. that's controversial, but look at the world we're building. We're, mm -hmm. we're suffering. Mm -hmm. So anything that alleviates suffering, this is what I do. Is there anything, and then I'm letting you go, I swear, uh, is there anything that like you see coming that could be a major curveball, minus like a meteor hitting the, just something of like this longevity, you know, we're going to be able to live to 200 years if everything keeps going according to plan. Unless the ozone layer collapse, or unless the acid rain comes, or unless you know a country builds this this atom bomb, and we all, you know what I'm saying, or unless there's a mercury spill in the ocean, and all of a sudden the fish that we were going to rely on for all this health is now all of a sudden poisonous. Like, is there anything that's like you look and you're like, if that happens, it's really going to throw a monkey wrench yeah. into things? Lots, lots. As I put in this book. Pandemics are bad. We could have a big one. Um, this came out, what, six months before yeah, the and pandemic? Yeah, get ready for it. I remember it's reading it being out. like, oh, here we go, the pandemic chapter. Who's going to worry about it? Of course, <laughs> scientists just sit around and worry about these things that are never going to happen. Yeah, sorry about that. Insane. Uh, I, Not in our lifetime, probably, but hitting, getting hit by an asteroid is not going to be fun. Mm -mm. That'll wipe us out, probably. But we, c we can engineer our way out of that, too. So yeah. I think it's we can solve the every world? problem. It's We'll wipe out humanity when we don't have any light for 10 years. That's what it is. Do you know about the seed bank? Yeah. Have you been there? Mm -mm. Do you want to go? Let's go on a like a fun trip. The global seed vault in Norway. I think Norway. it's in Norway. This is what it looks like. And yeah. it has every seed from every uh, plant ever in here. So that if mm -hmm. we do have... Uh, whatever, an atomic bomb or some sort of like major destruction of the world, this will still but be But we need here. robots to go. We'll get yeah. Lex to build us a robot to, to go, go in and get the seeds. And plant them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With no light. But, for... then, but then the robots will say, but I don't need plants. So why am I doing this? Look at this. The fact that we've thought ahead this far really makes me think scientists know something we don't in terms mm. of imminent destruction. Because why would all these people spend so much money taking every seed, putting them in a vault a thousand feet down in the thing if something bad wasn't for sure going to happen? Well, it's for sure going to happen. It, it's happened many times before. It's just not going to happen soon, I don't think. Uh, but that building looks like a, something out of Star Wars. Is Clearly, that cool? That's all they were trying to do. And they have every single seed on the inside. Like this makes me feel very comfortable for the future, but also very worried for the future because it makes me think that scientists, you guys know something that a lot of us do not know and just aren't telling us because it would cause mass panic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told you one thing, that the asteroid's gonna come. We just need to knock it out. Are we gonna have technology to be able to reroute it? For sure. By got, the time We've got happens? thousands, if not tens of thousands of years to get ready. Okay, got it. But what if we live that long? You're going to make us live so long that what if we all die by asteroids? This is the fate you want for us, that we live so long that we just get hit by an asteroid? I would like to die yeah. before then, please. Sure. That's my grand plan. Thank you. And, um, okay, last question. I'm letting you go. Thought on sen senescence therapy, therapies to turn on zombie cells back to healthy functioning cells? Yep, that I think made that's sense. that's a Sandra Bullock question. Wow. Girl, you're on. she's on the next level, though. She knows... She's just too smart. Okay, it's a, it's a good question. Okay. Uh, so senescent cells accumulate in your body. Mm -hmm. My skin, probably full of them, being an Australian. They cause havoc. They cause cancer. They cause a lot of inflammation. And if you get rid of them and you're a mouse, they live longer. And in humans, they get healthier met metabolically. So it's great to get rid of them. Uh, there are a couple of ways of doing that. There are molecules called senolytics. There's a couple of molecules... I keep saying molecules. Is there a, a chemicals, supplements from plants? One called physetin, one called quercetin. These are from strawberries and onions. 
that have been found to kill these senescent cells or at least make them less aggressive. And so that's one way to heal these Eat things. strawberries and onions. No, good luck eating 10,000. <laughs> Oh, okay, you could never get from no. them the amount you'd need. Okay. No, it's like trying to drink enough red wine. Okay. No, <laughs> to get the work. antioxidants. Well, the resveratrol from red wine, you need to drink 200 glasses a day to get the same amount that I'm eating. That's so funny which to I me. I don't recommend. I know a couple of people that probably do. Yeah, right. Doesn't make you live longer, unfortunately. Mm -mm. But there's a new way that we have discovered. Well, my graduate student's going to kill me for saying this, but we're excited about the possibility, mm -hmm. let's just say, of instead of killing off those senescent cells, and if they're in your brain, you don't necessarily want to kill them. You just want to make them healthy again. Mm -hmm. We are trying <laughs> and promising results in reprogramming those cells to be normal again because they're not messed up so much as people thought. It's just their epigenome is messed up, which we can now reprogram and make normal again. The way we restored eyesight in those old mice uh, earlier right. this year. And... So this would be instead of like like the the example I'm thinking of is like chemotherapy where it's in order to kill the cancer cell you also kill a bunch of healthy cells too. This would be just targeting the one unhealthy cell instead of trying to kill it and maybe killing good ones and the you just reprogram it and make it good. Right, but you make his, it important his, again. Here's the other good thing, is that you can reprogram we think a senescent cell to be normal, but if you reprogram a normal cell it also gets younger. That's what we just published. So we've been, found a way so to reboot the cell. This. How well? How where is this available? In my lab. Do you want to come? Yes, I do. Shoot you up with a virus. But then I'd have to get on a plane, and then I'd be bombarded with UV rays. So we cancel out the whole well, point. We can reverse that. Ugh. Last thing: your thought on exosomes and stem cell therapies. Okay, so exosomes are little membrane things that float in your blood that are very small that have only just in the last ten years become well known. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's some really good therapies, uh, drugs that are in development. It's huge. So that there's there's nothing wrong with exosomes other than we don't know if they extend lifespan, but it's a huge real field and there may be Nobel Prizes awarded for it. I had, I want to say five or six years ago, a, a friend of mine who is um, the daughter of a famous comedian from the 70s who has like just a lot of access to fancy things and doctors. He's aging and trying all sorts of experimental stuff. I can tell you who it is off the pot. Um, but uh, she said, I have this stem cell person coming into town. He comes and he does like racehorses, which by the way, we hate. We don't support racehorsing, any of that shit. It's it's awful. But um, does expensive animals, does people, goes to the Middle East. Like, and I got it. It was a stem cell drip. Okay. Was that real or was that a scam? It depends on the stem cell and the doctor. Uh, Interesting. The that there are some really good stem cell therapies for the knee. Uh-huh. The problem with stem cells... Uh, now you're well, thinking, no, I'm, I'm going to call the doctor. I'm just thinking the things that make you decide someone's legitimate or not, if you have no understanding of what credentials mean, I'm just like, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I guess he did have like some purple on the back of his <laughs> neck from dyeing his hair. Like if he can't dye his hair right, he's probably not a good doctor. The things that I would decide a good doc uh, constitute a good doctor are just so ridiculous anyway. I'm like, yeah, he had a little leather bag and a monocle. <laughs> he must have been a real doctor. It's like... Well, it's pretty easy for me to know if somebody knows what they're talking about. Because there's a lot of like like people going over the border to Mexico to do these stem cell therapies. And and the celebrities that told me they were doing it, I was like, well, you don't look that great, so I'm not going to do it. But, you know, in terms of like injuries, I shattered mm -hmm. my shoulder. Should I be putting stem cells in my shoulder? Well, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to say you should do anything. But you tell doctors what to do. I advise doctors. What would you advise my shoulder doctor to do with my shoulder? Uh, get a good doctor who knows what they're doing. Um, I know some knees that have been very well repaired by uh -huh. stem cells. The problem with stem cells, though, is that they don't last very long. They don't go where they're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. So our approach of reprogramming and rejuvenating the, st the cells that are already there, making them young, mm -hmm. I think ultimately will be a better approach. But Is the um, – and I wonder if this is a problem in Australia – is the sort of hold up with stem cells that where we get stem cells, a lot of people constitute as human life and that's the problem? No. It's not politicized that way? It used to be, but now it's fine. We can make stem cells out of anything. I could take your- Got it. I take a swab, give me some of your hair, your skin, and I can, if I 
had the time and money, I could clone you. Mm -hmm. um, but we can also build- We already did that with the robot. You saw her. It didn't go so well. No. She's not in good shape. <laughs> but we, we can do a she lot with these cells. She looks younger than me. I look at that bitch every day and I'm like, I used to look like that. So we could grow a mini Whitney brain, mm -hmm. which we do in the lab. They're not Whitney's, but we could do that. We grow little organoids. We can grow skin mm -hmm. and we could make stem cells and put them back into you. Are we going to be cloning humans at some point or there's going to be laws against that? There, I think there are laws against it. Um, somebody in China did that and it wasn't, um, no, it was Korea. They claimed it. But do we even know what's going on? There's also like, you know, as I heard you talking about this on, I think it was Rogan about, you know, government. We don't know what other countries are working on. So there's not like a universal global like, OK, even though we're from different countries and we have different values, we're all the best science. Let's all scientists log in the room and just compare notes. Yeah. Or is it still a very furtive like. We don't want to share things because then they could take it and do something. Well, it's changed in the last few years. We scientists used to talk all the time, didn't matter nationality, but that's changed. Uh, it's been become political. And even today I got a letter saying, be careful where you teach um, in the world. So it, it's a rough time for scientists, actually. It's not as collegial as it used to be. We have to watch out, um, sharing ideas. There's a lot of suspicion, especially towards the East. Okay, but what, how do we know there's not stuff they're working on over there? I mean, the CRISPR baby, that was that was just what was made public. Like, is there anything, because I like to worry about things I cannot control or fix at any point. It's like sort of my brand. Um, like, do we need to worry that- That people are cloning each other? Um, I don't, I think you got bigger things to worry about. Yeah. I mean, we should worry about climate change at this mm -hmm. point. It's doable. It's really doable. You can. But if we clone people like you, we it. might solve climate change in two weeks. If we're selectively cloning <laughs> enough, brilliant people, that could be the solution. Don't clone everyone. Don't clone the weirdos that are annoying. Don't, don't clone the people that shouldn't even be around. In the, there shouldn't be one of them, much less two of them. But like, is there any case of like cloning you so that you can be in five places at once? I've thought about it because I've got too much to do. <laughs> I think one is enough, but it's it's certainly doable. It could be being done, who knows. Like, is that got... the fix of how to save the world? That it's not <laughs> that we're like, have one person trying to solve one thing alone. What if you had five of you in your lab? Maybe one day that'll happen. I mean, they, they probably all wouldn't get along is my guess, but. That is for sure, <laughs> yeah. But um, cloning dogs is pretty easy. A friend of mine here in LA, his dog was dead and they took some blood from him mm -hmm. and made three more. Not a fan. Uh, because the, and, and look, I'm also a person that is so attached to my dogs. If I almost lost one of my dogs a year ago and there was, I was Googling it. I was, you know, when I'm in a time of pain, that seems like the only solution. I got to clone this dog. But when I found out the way that they're born, it's like via cesarean and the mother usually dies and uh -huh. a lot of other pups die mm. for the good, three good ones. There's I, like, it just feel, I'm big on just, there's 5,000 dogs at the rescue right now that are going to be put down tonight. Mm. Go get one of those. Cause you'll learn something about yourself taking in a dog that you're going to have to be patient with and train. Like, like to me, you're losing the experience of the medicine of a dog. If you're just cloning one that you already have that, is fitting to the person you were 10 years ago when you got the dog. Like there's a dog that needs you and you need a dog that's out there that's gonna teach you something. What about if your partner dies, should you bring them back? Not if I killed them. <laughs> yeah. Or I guess, I, I don't know, if, if I knew I could bring my partner back to life, I'd kill them every morning. <laughs> I was like, who's that text from? Boom. Right. That's, we can bring him back. I'm just sorry. It was in the heat of the moment. <laughs> I'm, I'm too worried about what I would do if I knew I could bring yeah. him back to life at any moment. I think that once there's kids in the picture, it's a different thing. And there's also something about the way someone dies. Like if someone drinks themselves to death, do we bring that person back to life? They don't want to live or they're not, they're not strong enough or whatever it is as someone that has a lot of family members that died of, of cirrhosis. But if someone dies by some freak accident that they didn't deserve and they died too young, like, is there ever going to have to be a, you don't deserve to be brought back to life and you do deserve to be brought, like who would ever even decide that? But you said that addiction is a disease and mm -hmm. we shouldn't vilify these people. So it's not their fault. That's right. I agree with you. But if someone 
uh, has three DUIs and kills a, a, a school of children on a school bus because they were drinking and driving yeah. and harming other people constantly. Yes, I believe um, as someone that subscribes to 12 step programs and EMDR and hypnosis and all of the addiction treatments that I know about that I believe work very well if you have the warrior spirit. There's some people that just cannot do it for whatever reason, maybe because their mm. their addiction the addiction behind the addiction is actually an eating disorder or is trauma from childhood. A lot of people that have eating disorders right. and plastic surgery addictions have been molested as children. Like, but give why people a second force chance. that person to live if they don't? I totally, oh, interesting. We all deserve a second chance. Mm, I agree. That's th Those might actually be the people you're convincing me that should be brought back to life first because it's like you, mm. you were dealt a shitty hand. Right. Now you should get a fresh start. Mm -hmm. But if someone's like, oh, I don't want to go through this again. I'm just going to fucking get hooked on drugs and have to live in that crowd. Like, I don't want this. Stop bringing me back to life. I don't want to live. <laughs> you know, because there are some people that when when I lose someone in my life to addiction, whether they're still alive in an active addiction, and I kind of have to just um, let go and detach with love because I know that they're just sort of a robot being puppeteered by this dopamine this beast inside them and i can't take their behavior personally and i can't get hurt by them because they're just ultimately hurting themselves and mm -hmm. their addiction has told them they're going to die without this thing yeah because i do believe that that addiction is you know it's everyone's problem if one person in your family has an addiction everyone in the family suffers people want to go well the addict this you're getting a disease a mental disease in reaction to these yeah, people right. so it's just as important to you than it is to the person who's in active addiction doing the ostensibly illegal thing you're also getting all these alcoholic behaviors that are socially acceptable which is like you know love addiction food addiction being in bad relationships perfectionism addiction whatever it is self-righteous indignation addiction the kind of people that go on twitter and have to be like mm, you guys are all wrong probably had an active addict in their childhood they couldn't control or that they developed their personality in reaction to that person of i'm so perfect yet compared to the person that was doing meth every day you're still an asshole you just developed your identity in comparison so that's why you think you're such a saint because the bar is so low like you got to look at yourself too and how you're repeating these patterns and becoming the perpetrator that you were once a victim of you're now becoming just as toxic as that person and that person has an excuse as we say in al-anon which is you know al-anon is you know uh aca adult children of alcoholics when you grew up in an alcoholic home and you were born addicted to drama or chaos is normal to you and you have this you know, arrogance of, well, I'm not an addict. Well, I don't drink. They're the ones that drink. They're the ones that don't have their shit together. They're the ones that, you know, wake up at noon and drink. I'm the one that's up and, and, and getting into a good school and doing all my homework. And then you go into, you know, uh, uh, double winners meetings are, have been very educational for me. Ones that are both Al-Anons that are family members. If you love an alcoholic, if, and again, as we define alcoholism, not, you know, for alcoholism to be present, alcohol doesn't have to be present. So people, I never saw my parents drink. That doesn't mean they didn't have alcoholic tendencies. That doesn't mean they weren't raging. They weren't leaving in the middle of the night to go get a prostitute. They weren't having multiple affairs. They weren't obsessing over cleaning the house and cooking and everything being perfect and, and scrapbooking and decorating and whatever. There's many addiction shows itself in many different ways and um, or looking at crazy shit on the Internet or checking out teenage girls when they walked by. Who We just we don't know. Um, but when you go into the Al-Anon rooms, it's all these people that just kind of think they're perfect because, you know, they didn't pick up that drink or they're not, you know, mm. they can have one glass of wine and put it down. But then you go into AA meetings and you see people be like, well, I was, I was drunk and I was texting and driving and I, that was my rock bottom. And then I was using cocaine and my girlfriend left me and I climbed over her wall and broke into her house. And then I'm saying, they're like, I've done all this shit sober. <laughs> I have no excuse for my behavior. I just did this yeah. on the internal drug cabinet alone. Like, mm. it, you know, if, if you're drinking, at least you have an excuse for your crazy shitty behavior. I just, that's just my personality. I just thought that was a good idea <laughs> when I had no alcohol in my body. And your point is? My point is I'm never letting you leave this room. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm addicted to try getting between an addict and their addiction. Yeah. And this is like, this book is my addiction. You're my addiction. This this science is my addiction. It gives me hope. I think comedians or, or anyone that's just thoughtful and trying to vibrate on a 
conscious frequency is thinking about death and is living in in fear and is trying to figure out what our purpose is here. And there's a lot of, ah, what's the point? I'm 38, I'm never gonna find the guy. There's a lot of like defeatist philosophies that we have that are really destructive because I think we are resigned to not living that long. And I, this, you know, on a bigger picture, giving hope of like, I don't need to give up now. I can still have a kid. I'm 38. Like the idea of being in your 30s and 40s, not being the end of your life and being like, no, this is when I'm at my smartest. I'm my most, my 20s was a wash. I mean, I was completely unconscious. Like, you know, when people are like, I wish I was in my 20s again. I do not. I was the worst version of myself. And I'm like, I now, I can actually be a parent. I can actually be a good partner. I can actually be a good podcast host, but I'm running out of time. So ugh, the tragic sort of, Shakespearean like irony of that. Exactly. So wisdom takes a long time. I'm still trying to figure out life. I'm in my 50s. By the way, 50s are great. As long as you're healthy. That's when I'm going to be. I feel like my smartest and funniest and best. And I hope that I'm like able to go do 50 cities a year and like share that with people. Yeah, great. We're on, on the same page on that. And, and we should be able to look forward to our 80s to be like that yeah. one day. Why not? And we would just keep getting smarter and wiser. And especially the existential dread of the our bodies are sexist. People like workplaces are sexist and people are sexist in Hollywood. Sex Biology is sexist. Like the thing that's holding women back from having everything that they want, it's not producers necessarily. It's our bodies. They just start rotting the second you <laughs> get into your 20s, you know? So, you know, for me, I, I try to take the blame off of people being like, they're sending me mom roles. And now that I'm in my late 30s, people don't think I'm young, whatever. My body is doing it. My body's the problem, you know? And I have eggs on ice. And even the psychological weight that was lifted off me when I froze my eggs, whether those are going to be viable or not, whether they're going to take, if, if I do IVF or whether I even use them at all or like give them to a gay couple or whatever. Um, or like give them as a giveaway on our YouTube channel, who cares, whatever it is, or sell them on eBay. Just knowing that I had an extra five years, I can't stress, I don't have to tell you this because this is what you've dedicated. I can't tell you the amount, I never would have started a podcast. I never would be with a healthy person. I'd still be in a toxic relationship with someone that was really bad for me because I was like, well, I can't get out of this. I'm 35, I'm gonna have to meet a new person and I'm, I'm just gonna have to settle for this. The amount of toxic decisions that I was making and resigning myself to and surrendering to because mm -hmm. I didn't think I had enough time left. Isn't it freedom? That it's freedom to, to change careers, to change partners if you need to. It's great. I think the amount of people bringing children into bad relationships will go down, which is then going to make healthier kids and health smarter people in general, because this fear of, well, if I don't procreate right now, I'm never going to be able to. So I'm going to procreate with the wrong person that I don't want to be with. And I'm going to show this kid all this negative, toxic shit. And they're going to see resentment. And this is the bar they're going to have for themselves. So they're going to repeat the cycle. It's like, to me, like the bigger way to break a, these cycles that age us emotionally. That's brilliant. It's really true. I mean, when we were in our 20s, you know, I had kids early 30s. I still didn't know how to write a check or you know pay for a mortgage. And now here I am raising kids. That's ridiculous. I, I think you're right. People our age should be the ones raising kids. Yeah. No, no offense to everyone who's young, but you do get better at it. Sure. Sure. And there's, 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 you know, on the same token, I'm going to say adversity is good for kids. And if you're 22 and you had a kid and you had no idea what you're doing, that kid's probably going to grow up to be really resilient. And you were a good parent by accident to them. You know, like for me, I look at all the mistakes my parents made and I'm finally at a point where I go, oh my God, they built, they gave me superpowers. That time they ignored me and dropped me off at the wrong school and forgot about me at school. It made me funny. It made me strong. You know, like I now see all of those failures as what made me resilient. So, if you're 22 and you know you have no idea what you're doing, you're probably gonna build a scientist or a great artist or something totally by accident. For sure, and and one of the reasons people still say don't have babies later in life is because oh you'll be 70 by the time they're in high school. Mm -hmm. But when you're 70, you can still be as fit as a 30 year old. Why not? And high school might start at 10 by then. If we genetically modify them to be smarter. Mm. Do you have any questions for me? <laughs> Where, I'm totally where kidding. Where do I donate my sperm? I have to. Can I tell you? I I mean, I did float this by Lex Friedman where I was like, look, I this does not have to be sexual. There is something to be said for people that are like, okay, we don't have to be in a relationship. We're all adults here. But like, 
we should just freeze embryos. We can put it in a surrogate. We'll sign something. I don't think you should only have kids with people that you love. Because sometimes the most brilliant people are deeply unlovable and annoying and impossible. And it's like, but it's like, this would be a fa this child would do something great, but we should not date or well, be together. Lots of people have kids with people they don't love. It's called, in many cases, marriage. Yeah. <laughs> but is there something to be said for, for, this is a kind of genetic engineering that's just not under a microscope. The idea of being like, okay, you, you and I should have a kid. We should not date. We'll fuck up the kid if we're married because if they see this dysfunction, they it'll undo the whole point of making the, this amazing kid. We'll co-parent. There's nothing sexual. You go get married to whatever weird fetish you're into and uh, I'll do whatever I'm doing, but we'll have this kid together because it's going to do something cool. Can you imagine what this kid would do? I'm imagining it. Yes. Okay. Well. Yes. I actually agree with that. I mean, not, not us two, but in general- yeah. Kids can be loved just as much by co-parenting. And there's something to be said for being like, commitment's not my strong suit. Maybe it's because I just haven't, I'm scared of it, whatever it is. I associate it, with, I have bad associations with it from my childhood. I need to do more therapy. But I do think I should have kids with a couple people <laughs> that I don't date. You know, there's, there's times I'm like, we're not good together, but our DNA would be... <laughs> but this is this is in our company, right? We need to be the match, right? You, you know... Oh, Whitney knows Match.com. Yeah. Um, she, oh, she worked yes. with Match for five years. Match.com. Oh, my goodness. Yes. So how about that? Genetic me in. Genetic compatibility. You don't have to be in a relationship. Why not? Yes. Is that, I mean, you can change yeah. your genetics, yeah. obviously, but it's like the idea of like moving forward. If you have the perfect man, but you hate his eye color, eh, that can be fixed. You know what I mean? It's like, what are the things... You know, I have this whole thing on red flags on the podcast. What are red flags? Like moving forward, certain red flags are not going to be red anymore because you're going to be able to change them. The fiction book, last thing I'm going to say, Super Sad True Love Story by Gary Steingart is uh, a dystopian satire about uh, dating in the future. This was written like 10 years ago and it's astounding how sort of on the nose he has been. He's this brilliant satirical novelist. He wrote Russian, not Russian debutats handbook, or I think he did, um, uh, Lake Success. He's just so brilliant. And we were working on making the TV show version of it. Black Mirror kind of did a couple of the things we were playing around with, but it is sort of about how do you date when all of your mistakes are essentially available to the other person at any moment, all of your weaknesses, because so much of dating is about pretending it's right. It's, it's like, I'm going to act like I'm the person you want. I'm going to hide all the bad things and I'm going to only present the good things and con you basically. But in the future, if I'm going to be able to know your blood pressure, your credit score, your blood type and your mm -hmm. propensity to get cancer, like, yeah. am I not even going to give you the first three months? That's when you drop it on them when someone's already in love with you and you're like, and I have a heart defect. And you're like, fuck, well, now I love you even more. You have a broken heart. Whereas if I knew that to begin with, I'd be like, it's irresponsible for me to date you because then I would be doing this to my child knowingly. Right. Imagine that. I, I'm, I'm not going to die at 50, right? Or, or I could die next week. You could know that ahead of time. My well, biological then that age is actually. Well, are really going to love this technology. I'm like, he's going to die next week. Let's get married now. <laughs> There's that. that. Guys are going to have a problem with it. Guys are going to be like, I don't want them to know when I'm going to die. They're trying to gold dig me, even though all I do is show <laughs> off my gold. All I do is drive Bentleys and Mercedes and show my watches on Instagram. But why Why are women so shallow? Why are they trying to gold dig me? You want it. You want it. And you love it. You can put your death date on your t-shirt if you want. That's sinister. <laughs> but, ha but, but if I know my death date is... September 10th, 2050, aren't I going to go, oh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to act even healthier, and that's going to change the date. Yes, that's the reason for this company. To basically scare the shit out of someone into living longer by telling them they're going to live less long. Well, waking people up to the fact that they will die, but there are things you can do to You can't be delude, delude yourself anymore. Well, it's not supposed to be scary. It's empowering. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't drive a car without a dashboard. Why do we do that for our health? Fascinating. Well, I have to let you go. I thought you weren't going to let me go. I don't want to. I have no interest. This is why I want to break your legs so badly <laughs> so that I can keep you here forever. Have you ever seen the movie Boxing Helena? It's a movie where this uh, crazy surgeon is so madly in love with this woman that he 
saws off her arm and le- arms and legs and just lives with, so she can't go anywhere and lives with her torso. I think it's very romantic. Uh, Kim Basinger famously was attached to it and then backed out and then they sued her. Like there's like a big Hollywood saga around the movie, but can't imagine why she backed out of that genius idea. But yeah, I do often fantasize about handicapping people I'm obsessed with and keeping them in my home, like on a mantle. I should have known that before. Kim. <laughs> no one told me. Uh, but we're going to do your age. How about that? We'll do a, a cheek swab. Right now? We can take one. Sure. Why don't do you that? come? When, when do you go back to Boston? Don't they uh, want me to I'll come speak at Harvard? Week. Don't they want me to speak at your lab? Uh, I'd be honored. Just, Please come. Like if you guys can afford my fee, I'll yeah. make it. We have a sign up if you want to sign up okay. to get this test. Are you doing with a couple people in Hollywood some of these these riffraff that you hate, some of these losers that you hang out with in Hollywood, are you going to do it with them too? Uh, yes. I won't say who they are. Okay. Um, but they're at the top of the sign up list already. Okay. It's like getting a Tesla. You got to know you. Well, you know, we're open to testing eventually millions of people, but we, we want to have people who are really into this sign up now for the, the early version. Okay. So we have, a, we have a place to sign up. All right. I'm in. Thank you. Yeah. Whitney's losing her mind over there. Um, Do you want to, can I say the place to sign up? Is that going to Yes, be? please. Say everything. Oh. So we've we've set up a place where people can sign up to get this test when when it's done. Okay. Okay. And look, go to the website now. Okay. It's there. Liveforever.net? It's, it's, no, it's called drsinclair.com with spelling doctor. Oh, dot, the whole word? D-O-C-T-E-O-R. Sinclair. Dot com? Yeah. I end these very awkwardly because there's no way to really do justice to being able to hear you talk this long. So I'm just going to let it literally and figuratively speak for itself. Do you have a good time? Yes. Are you mad? About what? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just so fascinated with how, you know, they say like God doesn't give with two hands. Like the fact that there is a forward facing scientist that is so eloquent and charming and fu- like it's just such a. And still employed. Gift. <laughs> right. Because not, a, a, you know, there was that show Scorpion that was on CBS for a while that was about this company that would have like babysitters for super smart geniuses that didn't have like social graces and who couldn't like pitch to investors and talk to doctors because they were just too nerdy. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, you Can don't you need that. Keep saying all You don't good need stuff. someone to translate what you're saying. You're able to do it in a way that makes me feel like I actually understand what you're saying and the chances are don't even thank you like I feel you like made my day I feel like I was able to have a conversation with you but I'm sure I, I was just beyond out class like that's such a gift thank you you're welcome and I mean that sincerely I'm a I've been a fan for a long time agree <laughs> smart you're a smart man they don't just give you a PhD if you're not a fan of me. That's the final question on the exam. <laughs> well, if someone had said 15 years ago that I'd be here, I wouldn't have believed it. So serendipity is real. Ditto. Yeah. I get to like right. have people I'm obsessed with in my house. Like it's just, it's wild. <laughs> it's not a bad job if you can get it. If I can get you into my house, we can live for 200 years. The most impossible thing has happened already. So I'm I'm open to anything. I'm sold. Um, okay, so thank you, David Sinclair. DrSinclair.com. Lifespan, if you don't have it, you hate yourself. Like, I don't even know what kind of person you are if you don't have this yet. Um, and the second book, you're working on it. Yes. But you'll be back when it comes out. If not sooner. Ugh, you said it on camera. You said it on camera. Um, okay, I love you guys. Thank you. What a joy. What an honor. What a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed my silk shirt that I wore for you and that I spilled all over as being nervous and frazzled and don't ride elephants per usual. Thanks guys.